And we are live. Hey, everybody. This is Roberto Blake. Hope you create something awesome today. Welcome back to the channel. Uh, welcome to another Monetization Monday. We're going to talk about how you can make money as a content creator. Today, we're talking about five different ways or five of the different business models around being a full-time content creator, making $10,000 a month from your content creation. By the way, we're not going to really focus too much on YouTube AdSense, but I will tell you the numbers around YouTube AdSense and how you have to well we'll we'll show you the numbers on how much you have to hit to get to 10,000 in adsense so we will cover that and cover the youtube earnings portion of things we're going to break this down across um adsense revenue because a lot of you care about that but i'll just be realistic with you most of you uh, it's going to be very difficult to hit those numbers um there is a strategy you can use that many of my clients use to make ten thousand dollars a month from the youtube partner program but it is um, a very very specific thing that they do and there are numbers that they're going to hit one of these days soon i will um have a uh, matrix for you um, that I'll share in terms of it's a chart. It's um, it's a chart that basically covers um, the thresholds for certain earnings. Uh, those of you who follow me on x.com slash Twitter, shout out to those who follow me over there at Roberto Blake. You've seen me actually break down earnings numbers, CPMs, RPMs, and the view counts per format based on live streams, regular video uploads, and YouTube shorts before, and how much each one pays, how many views on average in different ranges you'd have to make in the best and worst case scenario to achieve that, what the averages would be. So I've, I've posted those numbers before, but it wasn't attractive and it wasn't easy to understand if you don't see it in a chart. So eventually we'll just do a chart around that for those of you who care about the ad revenue side but i will be showing you stuff in here because we'll cover things like um you know um we'll cover like for example uh my lifetime earnings from adsense per and we'll look at it with individual videos and um the views around that and which uh, videos earn the most and we can talk about even the rpms and cpms across those videos with the lifetime earnings i don't mind sharing and showing you guys that so we'll We'll definitely talk about that because I have the numbers um, from the ad revenue here. We'll talk uh, about sponsorship, but as you can see, I do have numbers that basically will allow us, if we account for RPMs and CPMs, if I add those uh, to the grid here, we will be able, and I'll, I'll make this a little bigger for you so you can see it a little bit more clearly, but we will be able to talk about specifically those of you who care about, well, I make money off my ad revenue, I make money off my views. We, we all know I talk about you should diversify your income. So we're going to talk about the YouTube Partner Program. We're going to talk about what you need to do with brand deals specifically. We're going to talk about memberships. We're going to talk about uh, product sales. And we're going to talk about affiliate marketing. These are five different ways you can use either in combination to get to $10,000 a month. You can use these five things in combination. And this is how I made my first $100,000 a year is I use these in combination I've been making over six figures as a content creator for about seven years now, I want to say. I think it's been seven years. Maybe it's eight. 2016, 2014. Okay, so 2016, 2014. That's about eight years, right? That's like, it's at least seven. It's about eight. So I've been doing that consistently um, there. Um, my primary ad uh, source of revenue now, a lot of people think it's my online coaching. It's actually my sponsorships and brand deals. Um, it's not close. I do well with my coaching. I don't have a $600 course yet. I only sell my time, uh, group membership, and I sell basically $99 products. So I don't have a $600 course yet. One day, hopefully this year. Um, probably around brand deals specifically and then content strategy. Um, but what I will say about it is, my sponsorships actually are the majority revenue stream for me, and that's true for most content creators. For other people beyond brand deals, it would typically be their YouTube partner revenue. That's not true for me. It's brand deals, then it's my own products and services, so my coaching business basically. So it's brand deals, my coaching business, then it's affiliate links, believe it or not. It's affiliate links. And you can get started like I did with the Amazon affiliate program. That did very well for me in the beginning. Now I do more software-based affiliate and I do direct to manufacturer affiliates too. So 
hardware and software, direct to manufacturer, better commissions than Amazon, does really well. So that's that's something you could look at. Um, I would say that incorporate into my coaching business model. If I even just separate out the membership model, the membership itself is still more than what my YouTube partner program would be by a significant amount right now. And then it's the YouTube partner program for me. And I would say that's my top five revenue streams ranked in order. So that's what I'm going to talk about today. And there's a there's a way to get to 10,000 a month on any of those. However, the most realistic thing for most creators is to combine these five different ways to make money and then between the five of them, you can start making $10,000 a month. Then you can start to scale each of them with the goal of each of them eventually getting you close to $10,000 a month each. Then you can be making multiple six figures if you decide to go that far. If you decide to go that far. Some people, $10,000 is plenty a month and they're comfortable with that. Not everyone needs to make a quarter million dollars a year. Totally understand. Not everyone needs to make half a million a year. Totally understand. Um, me, um, right in the middle there at three change, right there at three change. So for a lot of people, yeah, sponsors and brands and then affiliates is the way to go for a lot of people. Um, I would say that, um, sponsors and affiliates, you can actually double dip on that. And it's a strategy I like to use quite a bit. And yeah. So again, remember everybody to, um, Invite people, share the stream, share the replay for the replay viewers. Hello, how you doing? Hope you've enjoyed looking at the data here on my numbers. So let's start to a degree with the obvious thing that a lot of you care about, which is the YouTube revenue side of things. Uh, and I'll answer any and all of your questions. It is Monetization Monday after all. Actually, before I get in, while I load, actually, I'll load up the RPM playback based RPMs. But while that's loading, I'll just go ahead and it's going to take a minute for that to load. So I'll just go ahead and shout out our sponsors here at the seven minute mark. Anyway, shout out to our good friends over at StreamYard for allowing me to be able to live stream on Facebook, LinkedIn Live, YouTube.com, uh, Twitch.com, X.com, formerly Twitter, and Kick.com, streaming to six platforms right now all at once. We're going to add a couple of more um, in the weeks and days to come. So shout out to our friends at StreamYard, the simplest solution in live streaming and multi-streaming. Thank you so much for everything you guys do. Uh, links are in the description down below if you want to check them out. Thank you to our friends at Opus Clip, helping me stay platform agnostic, play in all the platforms at scale with easy to use AI tools to repurpose and cut up my long form content. The plan is eventually to actually grow the highlights channel. If you guys uh, search for that, you can go Roberta Blake Highlights or Roberta Blake Speaks is the YouTube channel. We're going to be doing highlights. We've done highlights there before. I have some data from that, but we're going to actually move using Opus Clip eventually once I'm done compiling all the videos. We're going to try to move to a daily upload cadence over there and post um, clips from these live streams so you can digest them more easily. We're also going to probably at some point move to a three upload a day cadence before the end of the year over there because we make enough content with three streams a week to justify doing three uploads a day on that once we start compiling everything and get a system going. So that's going to be so dope to actually be playing with that. And eventually, we're also going to use some of my interviews. We're going to go with YouTube Shorts over there for my interviews for repurposing. We're not going to use the repurposed stuff here on this channel. I'm actually going to make original shorts for this channel using tools in Opus Clip actually to do original shorts, something a lot of people don't think about. So shout out to our friends at Opus for making short form possible and making clips possible, all with AI curation. AI B-roll and animated uh, captions. So link in the description down below. Finally, how I do my coaching business that makes me um, another 100K plus a year is our good friends at Kajabi, making sure that I don't have to give YouTube 30% of my membership money and I get to keep it. So I don't have to give up 30% of the $5,000 a month membership that I started. Um, so shout out to Kajabi. Best for communities, courses, cohorts, and coaching. Uh, link in the description down below. Thank you to all of our sponsors. Let's get back into the live stream. So, again, there you go. Sponsorships is how we pay the bills, even over here. But if we go into the data, and I show you guys um, not only the estimated playbacks and revenue, we don't really need the subscribers. I'm going to see if I can 
um, hide that from our chart. The only reason I want to hide that from our chart is I want to prioritize um, the estimated monetized playbacks, the views, and I want to also use RPMs and add that to our chart by content so I can show you one um, high paying, high value content. But then also I want to break down which these individual videos that earned a lot of money so that you can kind of see a pathway to what kind of views you need with what kind of RPMs you need to make a certain amount of ad revenue. So what we're going to do is we're going to hide the subscribers metric because we don't need that. We already know I've got the 600,000 subscribers. Yay me. We, we don't need to do that. And what we're going to do is we're going to look at these um, view counts, their RPMs, their overall uh, estimated playbacks in YouTube that were monetized, what YouTube paid for paid us for views. Meaning we're going to see how much YouTube pays us for the views, how many views they paid for out of the monetized views. Okay, and, and you can see a discrepancy, by the way, to some degree. Uh, a primary example is we had a $12 RPM video and um, YouTube actually didn't pay us for about roughly 200,000 of those uh, views. Now, the, uh, the estimated revenue on that is still extremely high, as you can see here. Um, in fact, let me see if uh, we can also differentiate the revenue that came from AdSense versus... Um, things like YouTube Premium versus um, the other things, just because I know a lot of you will care about that. I know a lot of creators don't share their monetization like this. If you're enjoying the stream, you got to smash the like button for the YouTube algorithm, but also give me your questions. Give me your questions about um, the data that I'm sharing around the ad revenue specifically and the YouTube monetization and what you want to know. I need your questions in the live chat. I need your questions even in the, um, I need your questions even in the replay of this in the comments around things you want to see because I'm probably the only large channel that shows this uh, particular information. And I don't think we need, I don't think we need the metric for impressions and click-through rates, not for this since it's Monetization Monday. And I don't think we need the, we definitely don't need the watch time data. What we really need is we need to know how much, uh, how many of our views were monetized, what the RPMs on that were, revenue per thousand views, um, and then what we were paid on the uh, overall video, but also what we were paid just from AdSense and not the other sources. Uh, but also it'd be nice to see the other sources so let's also see what we got in YouTube premium revenue because a lot of you don't realize YouTube premium can pay really well. A lot of you don't realize that. There's even a way to see um, how many um, views were premium views, believe it or not. Let me know uh, what you want to see. Um, Joy asks, hey, Roberto, is Kajabi good for a lifestyle blog? Uh, it's good if you have a lifestyle brand and then you want to sell something in relation to that lifestyle brand. So it could be, and you could still write blog blog post for your lifestyle brand. Next break, you should let us in the chat with sponsors. Shout them out too. <laughs> All right. The Divine Chef says, I'm so happy I joined your awesome Creator Academy. In such a short time, we've already learned so much to help my channel. Thank you, Roberto. Yeah, absolutely. And shout out to any of the Awesome Creator Academy members uh, here. If you want to check that out, uh, we do have Awesome Creator Academy linked in the description of the video. Um, yeah, and by the way, sub some channels like Clover Attack uh, can make money even with smaller um, audiences. And part of the reason... Um, has a lot to do with the fact that they can work directly with sponsors and manufacturers because his niche is very specific and his niche gets hit hard on YouTube. Uh, Clover Tack, big um, you know friend of the channel here, 
is um, one of the leading Second Amendment channels like on YouTube. And, and he understands a lot in terms of diversifying and with the fact that AdSense and YouTube is not friendly to every single type of content. There are certain types of content um, on this platform that don't get love um, from YouTube, unfortunately, for a lot of reasons. Um, I'm not afraid to say that some of them might be um, a different point of view on politics or on things that are heavily regulated. So a Second Amendment channel would be one of those. And a channel like that has to go directly to sponsors, has to go directly to um, affiliate links from manufacturers directly. But those audience members are heavily invested in the content. They also tend to be older and have disposable income. So yes, even a 1,000 subscriber channel in the right niche can make more money with their audience than with AdSense because the viewers supporting with their wallets matters more. And some brands understand that they can't advertise well in social media. They'll work with influencers, even micro or nano influencers in a niche that's very hard on advertising or is heavily regulated. I've seen this with Second Amendment stuff. I've seen this with the cannabis niche. Um, I've seen this um, with a lot of different things. So just keep in mind that not everyone's an entertainer. Not everyone can be Mr. Beast. Not everyone can make viral content. Some content on YouTube will have some limitations with regard to its capacity for reach or limitations on how it can be monetized. There are creative ways to work around that by diversifying how you make money. We'll talk about AdSense because I know the far majority of people care about it and they've never seen a big creator show off um, this part of the dashboard. And I know people care about it, but it's not everything it's cracked up to be, y'all. And there are just some niches that will never, ever get any love from AdSense. That's just how it is for some channels. And I think y'all understand that. I think y'all really do. Um, so there's, you know, so there's things. And a channel doesn't always have to be um, large to get sponsors. And remember, we don't just talk about YouTube here. We're talking about being multi-platform. YouTube is my biggest platform, but you can have multiple platforms and you can have some sponsors that work differently with YouTube, Instagram, TikTok, a newsletter, um, X.com. There's a lot you can do. So if things aren't working out on YouTube, I don't want you to get fixated on that. There are other platforms and content or sponsors or money might work differently there, and you should be using it to your advantage. You, now, again, I know it can feel overwhelming. One of the reasons I use StreamYard and Opus Clip is because I can be multi-platform, but I can focus on YouTube and Twitter in terms of direct platforms, but I can repurpose in everything else because of Opus Clip for repurposing video shorts and reformatting them. I can use um, with Twitter... I can go ahead and take my brain dumps in Twitter and then repurpose that for content for LinkedIn and also even for my newsletter and make it coherent. <laughs> and then I also, with YouTube, I can multi-stream with live streaming and podcasting and distribute on multiple platforms. And that can make me money because not only can I get revenue from the partner programs and all the platforms, but I can get affiliate money. I can get affiliate money and that could help. And then there's other things you can do. You can sell your own products. You can sell merchandise if you're not an info product creator. You do print on demand. You can do uh, books. You can do uh, coloring books, comic books, so on and so forth. There's a lot you can do. You can do memberships. Um, you can funnel people in Patreon. So uh, there's a lot. Uh, Mostly Money TV, thank you for the super chat. He says, thanks for this live stream. I remember you talking about this in your book. Um, now we're diversified to $10,000 plus monthly. Well, shout out to you. Congratulations. Salute. Ten See, this is what I'm talking about. This is, um, you know, $10,000 plus monthly. We want to get more brands. Question. I get a lot of brand offer emails. How can you tell which ones are real or spam? Okay, actually, I do want to cover this. So um, we'll go back to the AdSense thing in a minute, but I do want to cover this because one, I can protect you from scams, and then two, this is actually really important for your strategy. 
For one thing, do not be desperate enough to look at every email that talks to you about sponsorship and brand deals and jump on it. A lot of times it can be scams. This is how they hack YouTube channels. This is how they steal your AdSense money. This is how this happens. So people get desperate about the brand deals. What you want to do is one, do not believe brand deal emails if they come from a Gmail account or a Proto Mail account, Proton Mail account, or anything like that, or a Yahoo account or anything like that. It needs to be a legitimate website, number one. Number two, if you see a website, maybe you check on that website. If you've never heard of these people, you see how long that website has existed. You can do um, an ICANN registry check through who is and see how long that website has existed and if it's a legitimate website or not. So that's really helpful. You can also check for reviews of that thing, uh, check in LinkedIn. Um, you know, So there's a lot you can do there to try to identify scams. So that's a big part of it. Number two, go and check their social medias and see um, their social medias, and that can help to some degree. Here's the other thing. If you've never heard of the company, it's probably not a good idea to do sponsorship with them, to be honest with you. If you never heard of the company, or you ask the biggest creators in your niche and they've never heard of the company, it's probably not a good idea and you don't want to be the first one to do it. You want to verify that creators have worked with that brand and that company to make sure it's not a scam. That's another thing. Number two, I believe, and I teach this in the Brand Deal Starter Kit, I teach this. We'll link to that here in a second. I teach this in the Brand Deal Starter Kit. I teach this in my workshops. I teach it to our Awesome Creator Academy members. I believe that you should make a list of the brands you actually want to work with and you should actually kind of put your foot down and be like, this is who I want to work with and I want to work with these brands. I believe in these brands. They share my values. My audience respects these brands. My audience knows exactly who this is. Here are the big creators in my niche. Here are the brands that they work with. I want to work with those same people to show them on that same level. And then as a result of that, with your brand deals, you know that you're working with legit companies, bigger creators than you have taken a risk on that. So they're going to take the most pushback if it doesn't work out. And then on top of that, you should be vetting brands. You shouldn't just be jumping at every brand that wants to work with you. Why do you want to work with that brand? Why do you want to be in a relationship with that brand? You should be interviewing the brands in a way, in a way, and seeing if they align with your values, if they are a good fit to work with you, not if you're just a good fit to work with them, not just if you're big enough to qualify with them, is the brand big enough to work with you? Is the brand respected enough to work with you? Does the brand have a good enough reputation to work with you? Does the brand have an awareness and a respect for your audience and your viewers and your community? And do they cater to your community? You need to be looking for red flags. And you need to, even when the money's good, turn down people for brand deals that don't match with your audience and don't match with your own values and your own red flags. You So you need to say, here are my green flags for working with brands. And we talk about this in the academy, and we have some guidelines on this in the Brand Deal Starter Kit. And I'm actually going to do some updates to this as well. We update our products at least once a year, typically. And um, what I believe in is you should have red flags and green flags for brands working with you, and then you should qualify or disqualify brands from working on you, with you based on whether they meet your um, values or not. And um, to show you kind of a point with that, we're going to go back to the AdSense thing in a minute, but I'm actually going to show you my media kit from 2024. And one of the things we have is one, we have a list of all the partnership opportunities to work with me. And again, you guys have probably never seen a big creator share their media kit or their rate card. You'll see my rate card here in a minute. But the thing is, one, I'm very specific about the audience alignment and what it means to work with my audience. And I, I, I talk about that and not just the demographics, which I do show off, but I talk about um, you know some of these data points and the types of content formats. But I talk about who my audience is and the relationship we have and what they respect about me. And then I have the packages. And the thing is, I, I believe that my community, all of you, I believe that I understand you very well. And I understand what you care about, what you value, what you're trying to accomplish. And I only want to partner with brands that I think serve that mission. And I want to see what those brands have done for creators in the past. And I want to see how they respect creators in the community and what they are and aren't willing to do. 
and I have kind of an internal list of red flags and green flags that I run brands through, but then I also price those brands into, here's what taking me seriously looks like. We can negotiate what you want to get, but here is, these prices are my boundaries because I, I don't deal with brands outside of these boundaries because at that point, I don't think they're committed enough. I don't think that they're serious enough and I don't want to play around, but I also want to know that they're going to come through for my community. And also I want them to listen to me when I say a product needs to improve. So I use these numbers kind of as my, you know, um, what's a polite way to say it's my vetting mechanism. It's my crap test. It's my BS meter for a brand being serious or being a fly by night company or being shady. And so partly my prices eliminate to some degree um, brands that are not worth it to my community and that I don't think are serious or that I don't think legitimate. This kind of like throws the conversation and gets them off of my you know, plate is, okay, if you're not talking these prices, we're not talking because you're not serious at that point. Now, again, I'm in a position where I can do that, where I can turn down money to some degree, to some degree. That's not what I'm suggesting all of you should do. I'm using this as an example for, I have a filtering mechanism for commitment. And I'm figure, I think that all of you need to figure out what are my filtering mechanisms for commitments and for partnerships and for relationships with regard to how I run my brand and how I run my community and what barriers are I setting up? What boundaries am I setting? And money is a boundary. Um, yeah, we're updating Marilyn Monroe. Thank you for purchasing the Brand Deal Starter Kit. The reason that we're updating the UGC playbook is there's completely some new strategies and guidelines I want to put in there, but also there's new government guidelines for the US and the UK that I wanted to make sure we updated. So I took down the old one because with PDFs, um, you have to completely overhaul them to make sure the information um, is correct in text format. And I also wanted to make a companion video to go with that UGC playbook to explain certain things. So um, I don't have an ETA for you because me and my team are working on it, but we're also doing a couple of things at once. And because I just got back from um, um, NAB show in Vegas, National Association of Broadcasters, um, my hope is that before, um, before I get back from CEX um, in maybe two or three weeks, uh, content entrepreneur expo. Um, before I get back for that, I hope that we'll have the new UGC playbook that is coming. That is coming. You can always hit me up with UGC questions, um, in any of my platforms in the meantime, if something feels urgent or you have a question, but we are making that playbook. And it's just that I'm being, um, what do you call it? I'm being kind of perfectionist about, oh, I want to add this. Oh, I want to add this. Oh, why don't we have this? You know, so just bear with me on that. Just bear with me on that. Um, oh, and thank you for the compliments on the media kit. Appreciate you. But yeah, I, I believe in um, using rate cards and media kits and pricing ladders and such things and anchor uh, pricing anchors as well and value-based pricing. I believe in kind of using these things to set very specific boundaries for being taken seriously and for vetting the relationship with brands and for securing long-term commitment, long-term investment. Um, and I don't think a lot of creators have the confidence sometimes to do these things. And I'm hoping that that's what we can change, but I bring this up and I bring up the money conversation side of the brand deal side, because I don't just want to talk about brand deals. I want to show you. And most creators do not have media kits. That's why I set one up. So if you want to check out the brand deals starter kit, which also comes with three um, media kit templates, I'm going to link to it here. It's also, I think, in the description, but I'll link to it in the chat and media kit templates. Uh, so you get three media kit templates. We're going to add more in the future. We're always updating. Um, but I'll link to it here. You guys can check it out for yourself, see if it's worth your while. But one of the things that I think is really important is that you really focus on if you want to work with legitimate brands, I think you should choose the brands you want to work with and have a reason why you want to work with them. I, I have Opus clip because I wanted a, a partner, not only in the AI tool space, but also 
in the repurposing space because when I talk about being platform agnostic, be across all these platforms. Well, what what does that look like? So that became important to me of like, I need a facilitator for that. I needed a streaming partner. I use StreamYard. I use Opus Clip. I bought these things first. I bought them first with my own money. I also have upgraded versions of the plan. So even beyond what they give me for free, I actually still am a paying customer. For example, I maxed out the storage for StreamYard. I'm still a paying customer StreamYard. StreamYard still gets $400, $500 a year from me um, because I pay for extra storage. Um, I maxed out the storage to... God, what was it? I forget how much I maxed it out, but it's pretty high. Um, so I still pay for it. Um, I wanted to partner with brands that can facilitate specific things that my audience needs. You guys need B-roll. You need copyright-free music. So um, Epidemic Sound, Lick.com, Storyblocks makes total sense for me to be aligned with that. Hardware, camera gear, aligning with B&H makes perfect sense. Um Different tools for optimization, vidIQ and TubeBuddy, makes sense to me. Camera gear, Sony, makes sense to me. Payment processing, PayPal, Google Pay, makes total sense. Content creation, Adobe makes perfect sense. So you can see that I choose uh, Kajabi, you know, needing to build and sell digital products, membership websites, courses. So I choose my brand partnerships based on what is it my audience might want to accomplish What's a brand partner that can facilitate that? And who am I already giving my money to? So I, that's how I choose brand partnerships. And that's one of the things you could do to avoid um, dealing with scams is just go ahead and just go to and go with the brands that you're already using and that you already believe in, the brands that your um, audience already is using and already likes, and the brands represented by the largest um, channels or what have you in your industry. So I, I think that those are all good mechanisms for avoiding scams. So um, we're going to go back here to the AdSense and we're going to break this down for you and break down the RPMs, the ad revenue YouTube pays, the YouTube premium revenue that they pay estimated monetized playbacks versus actual views. We'll get into all of that. I just want to make sure I honor um, some of your remaining super chats here. So we had a super sticker from Joy. We answered this one from Mostly My TV. And, yep, oh, here we go. So Mostly My TV says, yep, they stole our Gmail and five YouTube channels. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Mm. Um, that's pretty. All right, I have to, I have to reread this here. So yeah, they stole um, your Gmail account, five of your YouTube channels last year when you opened a contract email, had to work with Google and YouTube to get them back, and it was only for 12 hours. Now most emails you don't open. Yeah, okay, so I'm going to give you guys um, some massive security tips on this one uh, to avoid this particular problem. So the way that you avoid this particular problem, and this one's very important. I need you guys to smash the like button right now, by the way. Smash the like button right now. But this is really important. One, do not tie your email that's public. Hey, contact email. Do not make it the Gmail account that manages your YouTube channel. If you like Gmail, make a business Gmail account that does not directly have access to your YouTube channel at all and use that for your brand contacts and your public email. Do not use your Google account and Gmail account that is tied to your YouTube channel for anything but managing the YouTube channel. Go ahead and if you're, so here's what I'll tell you. Make a separate email account. Your Google Gmail account tied to YouTube should be a private email address that nobody knows even exists. They cannot hack an account that they do not know exist. Understand? Does everyone understand what I mean? They cannot hack an account that they do not know exist in the first place. So the Gmail account tied to your YouTube account should always be private and nobody should know what that account is, all right? Then for managing online business, contact forms, even getting your email marketing, all your other social medias, all that stuff, you should make a separate email account and it can be a google gmail account if you just like how gmail works but it should be a completely separate account and it should never ever have access 
to your private YouTube Gmail account, okay? So you need a private email, and that manages YouTube, and you need a public email to deal with business and deal with fans. Do we understand that? Do we under, do you, like, I want to make that clear. So everyone in the chat, do we really fully understand private versus public email accounts and that your YouTube account, that needs to be a private email account. Even your bank accounts requiring an email login, separate account that's not tied to anybody on social media at all and nobody should know what the email address is for this account. So there's like three private emails you need. You need a private email that is a master email for your social media accounts. Then you need a private email that's just for your YouTube channel. And you need a private email that's just for your banking information. I cannot stress this enough. This is really important. And no one should know what those email accounts are. That's why they're private. Then you can have public emails. You can have a public email that's, hey, for business, hit me up at, you know, mostlybusiness at gmail.com. And that's a business account. And it should never touch any of your payments. And it should never touch your YouTube channel ever, ever. And this will limit the ability for your stuff to be hacked or to be compromised. Do we understand? Private versus public emails. And this will protect you. And then you won't have to deal with this. I'm sorry you guys went through this Mostly Money TV, um, but thank you again for the uh, super chat. You got Ty's Hot Mess History, $20 super chat. Thanks for everything. I wasn't ready for a brand deal when you did a consultation with me. My content is ready now. Just a tip, creators can use Google Transparency Report to check to see if links are safe in the deal offers. Yes, you can, and that's actually a really good tip. Thank you for that, uh, Ty's Hot Mess History. Appreciate you. Also, again, shout out to another successful silver play button YouTube channel that I've coached with um, and everything. So congrats again to you. Also, um, Ty, when you get a chance, hit me up. Um, if uh, we can do something to where I can order a copy of your uh, silver play button to add to the Awesome Creator Academy Hall of Fame, um, I'd love to do that. Add it to the trophy case on the bookshelf here. Um, and I'll pay for all of that and everything, uh, you know, or I will trade you a 30-minute consultation. Your choice. Dealer's choice. So either way. But I'd love to get a copy of your play button for the Academy Hall of Fame. We've got a couple of them coming in. Uh, we've got Jen from Sewing Report up there. We've got um, Cassandra from Becoming a Farm Girl coming in. We've got uh, Vanessa's. And when Mugnify, I think I see you in the chat, when you get your reaction channel to 100K, you're almost a 90 now, we'll add you to the Hall of Fame as well. Oh, Metal Eagle Chess Center's here. Uh, thank you for the $5 super chat. I joined the pro group for Awesome Creator Academy. I accidentally opted to not receive an invitation to join the email list. Where do I join the email list? Uh, I will send you a link uh, to that, but also for anybody to join our newsletter. Um, if you want the newsletter, and that has a lot of great stuff, um, you can hit me up at um, robertoblake.com slash newsletter. And you guys can get that and become smarter and learn more about monetization um, in just uh, five to 10 minutes a week. So uh, check out the newsletter. So boom. Um, also, a lot of you should start newsletters. You can get sponsorship for newsletters. I'm also doing uh, with mine, since it's with ConvertKit, we now have ad revenue on ConvertKit. It's in beta anyway. So um, ConvertKit is basically becoming the YouTube of email newsletters. Um, and I, I think it's working out really well. Um, the RPMs or RPOs are pretty interesting. Um, I mean, I could technically show you guys that, I guess, but we'll get back to AdSense in a minute. But I mean, I can show you that I haven't had it activated very long and I'm blocking half of the advertisers because I don't think they fit. But if I add this, uh, you guys can see it. So I have a new uh, income source, and that is ad revenue in my email newsletter by inserting ads at the bottom of my email newsletters. And I have some evergreen newsletters. So with just a few impressions and not a lot of clicks, um, 
again, you can see it, it. This is just I literally started the ad program. I got accepted the ad program. I started this two days ago. So don't judge the 13 cents. I started it two days ago, my friends. Um, so don't don't judge it too harshly. So I started two days ago and with just um, it looks like 200 impressions. OK, so just with 200 impressions and one click. It was 13 cents. All right. Now, I just want you to imagine, though, what happens when because I have a 12,000 email list, right? No, sorry, 13,000 email list. Excuse me. 13,000 email list an over 50 percent open rate an over 50 percent open rate. So let's just go with six thousand. Excuse me, six thousand impressions per email. Once we start doing two emails a week. That's 12,000 impressions. So the thing is, if I'm roughly getting, oh, I don't know, it looks like for every 100 impressions, it's about six cents, let's say, right? So if I divide this by 100, and that's a week, and then I multiply that by 0, 0.6 cents, um, and then we're doing that every month times four is it's modest it's modest and it's just ad revenue but we'll make on the ads because i'm not spamming my list and my list isn't huge on the ads and again this is just starting so maybe it goes up after a while it looks like we could make maybe i'm doing the math wrong but it looks like we could make 300 dollars um, in ads or something like that. It looks like there's potential here if we email enough. If we do enough emails, it looks like there's potential. So, I mean, something's better than nothing. And in my case, um, the newsletter, it depends on also how much we do evergreen sequences, follow-up sequences. There's other things we could do. So it really just depends. But there's potential here. And it depends on how frequently you want to do emails. There's potential here. So, in ad revenue from emails, I think we could get it up to maybe $300 a month. So I think there's potential. <laughs> Let me borrow uh, 13 cents. Uh, yeah. So again, you know, just something to think about. But over back on YouTube side, when it comes to um, ad revenue... Um, and then we will get to this question. I'll get to some of your questions. Um, one of the things that I want to show you is this. Let's go to... All right, so yeah, we have this sorted by views, okay? So I want to show you something. Um, for one thing, um, the estimated monetized playbacks versus... The actual views is interesting because it just shows you that YouTube, not all views are monetized. So that's one thing. Number two, look at the difference in RPMs from some of these videos based on topic. So some, so not all content is valued equally. So we want to make that abundantly clear. Because look at the gap in the RPMs on these videos and look at um, the earnings to view gap. Look at this video um, here, for example, um, the 100 ways to market yourself. As much as that still had a very high RPM, the monetized playbacks all being equal, the affiliate marketing RPM was just so astronomically high that even though it got less views, it made um, you know, almost double the amount of money. It made almost double the amount of money with less views. And that's just because some things in terms of their RPM are just so high that it cancels out getting more views. This is why not all niches, all videos are equal. Now, some of you are looking at these rates and going, well, bloody hell, Roberto, I only get $2 RPMs or $5 RPMs. Um, Business-related niches, might sometimes it depends on whether they get views. Some get views, some don't. You guys know some of my videos. I can get a video that gets 20,000, 10,000 views, and I can get another video that gets 100,000, 200,000 views. It just depends, right? However, some videos are so much more valuable than others, it doesn't matter how many views I get. And then some videos, because I monetize them 
through other things other than AdSense, even as good as they do on AdSense, they might make double that on the back end. So there is just something to consider in terms of, well, what is this format? I mean, we all know YouTube Shorts gets a bunch of views, but we know it doesn't make a lot of money, right? YouTube Shorts for some people goes viral, gets massive views, but doesn't make a lot of money. And that's also true with regular videos. Uh, hell, some of the highest earning videos and some of the highest earning creators on YouTube do live streams, and they don't need a ton of viewers to do well on live streams. Some people have wonderful super chat audiences. Some people's live streams have affiliate marketing built in, have sponsorship built in, especially in the podcasting side. So um, there's a lot more to this than people realize. And you can see that my live streams are incredibly lucrative. And again, some people say, of course, those are lucrative, bro. It's, um, it's brand deals or it's, um, it's um, super chats. But even for my live streams, if we look at some of these videos that I have that are successful, look at this. This is a three-hour live stream, and it made 1000 in YouTube premium revenue, but made 700 on AdSense revenue. Now, this doesn't include super chats either. So again, a live stream replay for me the money is not necessarily in the super chats, but I love the super chats. Keep them coming. Keep the super chats going. But the reality is if I do well on the playbacks for my live streams, the RPMs are high enough to where live streams are worth a lot of money. And then the YouTube premium revenue is really good for me in particular on live streams. So again, imagine earning a thousand dollars from live stream replays that you leave up in just YouTube premium revenue before we even go to AdSense. And so other videos that do really well for me and get like views, um, there the thing is it's possible for something to get less views but earn more. And I just wanted to demonstrate that for you, that something can get less views and it can earn more. And I wanted, again, I'm one of the only large creators that will show you this data on their own actual channel that there there's just um, a lot of different ways you could look at the value of these videos monetarily um, some things can earn in ad revenue sometimes they'll earn in super chats sometimes they'll earn through youtube premium revenue and some things are long tail and earn through their replay value especially the live streams the live streams may not get a lot of views up front but they can earn a lot of money on the back end. Here's another successful live stream that got a thousand dollars of YouTube premium revenue, and without super chats, it still earned another almost three thousand, two thousand seven hundred, just in AdSense revenue. So a lot of people are underestimating how much AdSense they could earn from their live stream video replays, and a lot of you are privating your live streams. You're embarrassed about the initial views or you're superstitious about the algorithm. But I hope that just seeing my data and then also seeing the payments around this can maybe persuade you to give live streaming a chance and, and see that it can be very lucrative for you. Even without the super chats, it can still be lucrative on both YouTube premium and AdSense revenue and that you can, you can make a lot of money here. Um, so don't underestimate its potential to earn uh, because the money is there. It is possible. Um, and again, some of you make content that's much more interesting than what I do. So there would be the opportunity. Even without a high RPM, if you get more views than me, if you get more views than me, not having a high RPM wouldn't matter as much for your monetization. If you can get drastically more views than me, some of you should be looking at vertical live streaming for this, just depending on what you're doing. Some of you with gaming, some of you with IRL streaming. I have clients who do IRL streaming. I have some clients that play mobile video games. So vertical streaming has been very good to them lately, and that's a new format. So I, I think that a lot of people are just sleeping on the live streaming and what it can do. But I think also some of you are sleeping on long-form content and how much just being able to have multiple ads can double the amount of money that you end up making. Um, so again... Just to be clear, something doesn't necessarily have to get all the views in the world to make a ton of money, but it, it, it certainly can help. And then in terms of, okay, Roberta, well, how many views, how many views do I need to get 
um, 10,000 ad cents. Well, I'll be real with you. Most of you are not going to have high RPMs. Average RPMs in YouTube are going to be, for most creators, under $5. On average, I would say average creator RPMs are about $3. So if you wanted to make um, 10000 for sure, and then not all views are monetized, because remember, sometimes there's a 20 to 30% discrepancy in monetized playbacks versus actual views that you get. So YouTube might only monetize half of your views or 75% of your views. It depends. And then that's assuming you don't get hit with invalid traffic issues. So if that's true, then here's what I propose. For most YouTubers that are not in a money-making niche, I believe that you need to get 3 million to 10 million views per month to make $10,000 in AdSense on average across multiple niches. I think that to get 10,000, the far majority of you, the far majority of you to be safe, we have to say that you have to get 3 million to 10 million views per month in order to make $10,000 a month on AdSense alone. If all you care about is AdSense, if all you care about is AdSense revenue, based on our projections and what we see in that YouTube can decide it's not gonna monetize every view, I would say the margin of safety to make 10,000 in ad revenue is 3 million to 10 million views. If you make 3 million to 10 million views on regular YouTube uploads, not YouTube shorts, you should be able to make $10,000 a month in ad revenue if you can do that. That's the math that I'm going off of. So yeah, so just based uh, based on the math, just based on the math, um, that's what I can calculate and go with. And um, I have the numbers and the data here based on RPMs and based on views and then based on what the actual AdSense payout is, not counting YouTube premium revenue, not counting Super Chats, not counting any other revenue streams. So based on the data provided here, and using baseline revenue stats like $3 RPMs and such, $2 RPMs and such, I can get the numbers to say that if we wanted 10,000 ad revenue, our margin of safety is we need 3 million to 10 million views based on that on average to get to $10,000 um, a month in YouTube ad revenue. We have to hit 3 million to 10 million views every month. That's the math. And you see what I'm basing that math off of here. So those are real numbers, okay? Real numbers. The good news is if you do that, that there's a high chance that you also will earn extra off of YouTube Premium. And then also you might get some uh, super thanks and some other things as well. So uh, that can benefit you. Now, if you're doing YouTube Shorts, those numbers exponentially increase. Um, those numbers exponentially increase with YouTube Shorts. Um, with YouTube Shorts, I would say you need 30 million to 100 million views a month to get the uh, $10,000 a month. Now, with the output and volume of content that people get, if their shorts are attractive or getting shared or going viral, then that is possible, and that's why some people are succeeding in doing it. But um, that's what the math would dictate based on what we see. And based on what RPMs can be and estimated monetized playback ratios versus actual views. Um, and again, we're using margins of safety here because remember, look at this one. Um, the estimated monetized playbacks on this video are 80,000, but we got um, a quarter million views. This one, we got um, estimated monetized playbacks is 160,000. We got a quarter million views. So remember, not all playbacks are going to be monetized. It could be half of them. YouTube can cut by half or a third of them. It could be less than half. You don't know. You just don't know. Um, same thing here. Look at this. It's a tenth of them on this video. It's a tenth of them. So 
understanding that YouTube will not pay you for every view on your video is a very important part of this. Look at this. Half of the views are not monetized. Half the views aren't monetized? Wild. Same for this video. Half the views aren't monetized. With this one, almost 100% of them were monetized. So uh, you have to um, really appreciate that not every view is a monetized view. That becomes very important in this equation. And then varying CPM rates. So we have to build in a margin of error and a margin in safety in our calculations in terms of how many views to make how much money. That's why if you want $10,000 a month, my margin for most of you would be 3 million to 10 million views. On my channel though, I know that the margin I need for that is kind of going to be closer to 1.5 million to 3 million views for me to do that. Worst case, worst case, 1.5 to 3 million views gets me on regular videos, gets me to the promised land and gets me to 10,000 on AdSense. Um, that's the numbers for me. Just that's that's how I know my channel works. If I have to guesstimate across channels, then that's why I use the, the data point that I used. Um, you can even see lifetime estimated monetized playbacks for me. Um, YouTube um, didn't pay me for roughly 40% of all of my lifetime views. 40% of all my lifetime views. So if we add that to the estimated um, uh, revenue um, for AdSense, if we go to the AdSense side, uh, 40%... That would add for AdSense another forty, fifty thousand dollars here. Actually, maybe it'd be a little bit more than that. No, it'd be more than that. Actually, I take that back. Forty percent. Oh shoot, that'd be another eighty thousand um, dollars. Wait, yeah, forty percent be another eighty thousand dollars. So yeah, it'd be about. Um, geez, man, eighty thousand dollars. Ah, God, that hurts my soul. <laughs> that hurts my soul. Yeah, estimated monetized playbacks versus views, roughly 40%. Uh, 10% is 21 times 4 is $84,000. Oh, God, that hurts. That hurts. Jesus, man. $84,000? Mm. All right. So, yeah, <laughs> the joys of YouTube. Um, Megan asks, hey, Roberto, can I book a session to ask questions for guidance on multiple channels and so on? Better understanding between the two. Thanks. You absolutely can. I'm going to get you a link for uh, coaching down here. So book a coaching call. You can go to uh, www.awesomecreatoracademy.com slash coaching. Creatoracademy.com slash coaching. And you can book a session and we can talk about your two channels. We can talk about whatever you need to. We can review your analytics. So uh, there you go. Appreciate you. Zolo Q asks, hey, Roberto, I'm 10 steps away from the first tier of YouTube monetization. Congratulations to you. How long does the application process take? Actually, I did a video about this. I did a video about the application process. Now, here's the thing. Typically, I've seen for most creators that they get it within seven days um, of applying as long as everything else is in place. I would encourage you to set up a Google AdSense account beforehand and then do the application process and make sure that it's linked to your channel so that when you apply, it's turned on and it's already ready to go. Um, don't do the application process while you're in another country because that'll be a problem. Um, even if you're putting in your home information, do not do it somewhere other than your home or your main business or place of residence. You want to do it in your same state at least and definitely in your home country because um, there are problems on the back end uh, with it getting approved otherwise. So you want to be at home basically when you do this. Um, you want you want to be at home when you do this. So that's a big key, big key to this. 
you want to make sure that the information you're putting matches to a T to whatever is on your government ID when they ask you to use it for verification for anything. So you want to make sure you're doing that for the verification process. Uh, do not screw any of that up. So take your time with it. Uh, make sure you do it right. Make sure you're not rushed or flying through it or too excited. You want to make sure that, oh, yeah, you're monetized. You want to calm down. You want to fill out the forms. You want to sit there painstakingly and take your time, double check everything, look at everything with your glasses on. You really cannot afford to screw this up. It's too hard to fix otherwise. Um, and so you want to go through this. The latest it takes is 30 days from the application process. You will not be retroactively paid for any views on your channel, whether ads ran on them or not. So there's no retroactive pay. There's no back pay for creators. Um, it's just from monetization forward. So that's what you want to make sure you're looking at. So don't get your hopes up on that. And then what you want to do, like I said, is they could approve it as fast as 48 hours. They did that on my second channel for me. When I got my second channel monetized, they did it within 48 hours. And that was during the holidays. So that um, that's something they'll do. I made a video about this. And then the other thing is I've seen a lot of creators get within a week on average. A week. That's it. However, because of problems with fraud and things like that, it could take up to 30 days, but really no later than that. So that's how the approval um, process um, works. Yeah, so that's how the approval process works. Good question, though. Great question. I did make a video about this. If you want to watch my video, you can see, hey, how do I apply for the YouTube Partner Program? Um, what does it involve? When do they um, approve you? How long does it take? I made a video about it. Crane TV, thank you for the 1999 super chat. Hey, Roberto, question. Could you share how you started Awesome Creator Academy and overcame the early struggles to ensure its profitability? Appreciate your insights. Your book and YouTube channel has been very helpful. God bless. Absolutely. Okay, so I'll give you a short version of this because I actually think I talked about it in a live stream about building the coaching business. I have um, some workshop Wednesday stuff planned for this as well around building memberships. I actually did a membership one, courses, coaching, all of that. So one of the things I did which I think is one of the smartest things I did. And you guys can use my Kajabi link in the description. I used Kajabi to build Awesome Creator Academy. One of the things I think I did that was smartest was because I had a coaching business is I priced my coaching calls in such a way, and this is because I earned the credibility. I priced my coaching calls in such a way to where the cost of making it profitable was booking one call in a month. So that means when I got Kajabi, I had a 30-day free trial. So I had 30 days to make money before I'm in the hole, right? So for me, in order to make money before I would go into the hole, I didn't have any products yet. I didn't have a digital product, whatever. So the first thing I started with was, okay, one-on-one -on -one coaching calls, something I was already getting requests for, something people already wanted from me. I said, all right, let's go. And I priced it so I would only have to get one call to break even, two calls to be profitable. And I knew that if I couldn't get two coaching calls in 30 days, that's a me problem and I deserve to lose money. So I taught myself that. I take absolute extreme levels of accountability and responsibility, right? Have done that most of my life. So the way that worked out for me was because I knew there was already demand for access to me and to my time, I could price those calls. And I started with the 30 minute calls, I believe. I think I started with the 30 minute calls. So I price it to where getting one of those paid for my Kajabi subscription and paid for those costs. And the second call, if I get it in a month, would be profitable. And I put myself in a position to where I hit up people, one, and started going lead gen. I started DMing and saying to people, hey, um, I've helped you with some stuff in the past or whatever. Hey, I see some issues here. I think I could help you with, would you be willing to do a one-on-one -on -one call with me? Oh yeah, absolutely All right. Okay, here's what it cost. Here's the link. All the details are there. If you have questions, talk to me about it. And people are like, okay, I'll check it out. So then all of a sudden, people were booking these coaching calls with me because I hit them up one-on-one. -on -one. Then also through word of mouth and able to show some results from that, other people started hitting me up. Then I went back to people that I did successful one-on-one -on -one coaching calls with. And I said, hey, I'm starting a membership for people like us to share information, 
coordinate. I'm also going to do some trainings on you guys. I'm going to do some webinars for you guys. And I'm going to do these group meetings that we can all attend. And you can ask me anything you want. We can also share amongst each other and the other members of the group. You guys can roast each other's thumbnails. You guys can give constructive criticism. We can do round tables. We can do it this way. And it'll be just us, not everybody on the internet. So you can feel comfortable with your people, right? And so then people was like, yeah, how much? Sign me up. And I started with like 29. And the reason I started with 29, I was like, okay, do you trust me to deliver a dollar a day in value for you? Yes or no? Easy. Okay, yeah, Roberto, you've delivered so much value for me. I trust you deliver a dollar a day. Okay, cool. So those were my founding members. Now, my founding members to this day still pay 29 a month. When later I got new people, I was like, okay, I know I can over deliver on value. So we're going to 59 a month. We're going to do all these things and all these bonuses. And all right, do you trust me to deliver $2 a day in value? Can, and do you trust me to do that? We're going to do two office hour sessions a week. Here's all the other things we're going to include, blah, 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 blah. Yes, Roberto, I absolutely trust you on $2 a day in value that I'll get that, not just from you, but access to a private community of other creators that are also have skin in the game. Yeah, sign me up. I'm tired of free groups. I'm tired of you know immature people. I'm willing to pay a paywall to be part of a premium membership. Okay, cool. So people did that. We have like 95 uh, active members now. And so uh, that's where it's at. In the future, again, everyone's grandfathered in where they come in. That's what I believe. And I think for those of you doing business, grandfather people where they come in, new people pay new rates, right? So you do that. You go directly to community. You go directly to people you built relationships with, people you had emotional investment in, people that you want to spend time with, believe it or not. I don't like working with people that I don't want to spend time with that I think are not going to respect my time, respect the community, respect other people's time, not going to be contributors. I love that our members share information unprompted. When they see something out in the wild, they share it unprompted. They respond to each other's post unprompted and give feedback to people on whatever they need, titles, thumbnails, something that we have an accountability club. We have a messenger group where people hold people accountable on their goals and hit them up on Monday morning. So these are things that you want to look at if you were building a coaching business specifically, or you're building some online membership community or subscription. One, you want to look at loyalty pricing. Loyalty pricing means that people keep paying the price that they came in on when you raise your rates. Okay. So loyalty pricing on subscriptions and memberships. You want to look at creating an ecosystem of value and what that looks like for you and what's included. And then you want to be able to say, well, here's why I can value this this way. This is easy. It's a yes or no. Do you, do you value this? Is this worth it to you? Yes or no. Would you benefit from access to this thing? Yes or no. So it's just a yes ladder. It's just a less shower. It's a yes or a no. So I believe in binary decision making. Okay. And so I believe that that's very powerful. So if you were looking to build any type of coaching business, this is work, by the way, for clients of mine that do, for example, I have friends uh, and clients in the fitness community, in the weight loss community, in the yoga community. I've coached people like uh, Brett Larkin, for example. I'm planning to interview Sarah Beth Yoga, OG creator, Sarah Beth Yoga, basically built the yoga space on YouTube. Uh, I plan to have an interview with her on the channel. My co-instructor, Andy Rivera, had her on her podcast uh, so she's gonna uh, hopefully um, we've met, we've had good conversations. I plan to have her on my podcast. So there's a so there's a thing like that, right? I understand coaching models for different niches and for the education space, people even in language learning, things like that. I've had someone who's a math tutor and I helped um, build a business model around the math tutoring channel they had. It's a multiple six figure business now. And so, there's ways to approach this, and I believe you have to do loyalty-based programs for one thing. People stick with you, their price doesn't change. So I think that's important. You also have to have reactivation cycles of what it takes to bring people back if they've left, and you also want to address the needs of people that weren't satisfied or why they left. And so you want to do things like exit surveys. You want to hit people up. You want to have that. So you want to have those kind of things in place if you're building that kind of online business. So again, I know that was long-winded, but a lot of you 
should be building businesses on the back end of your YouTube channel. And like I said, I built Awesome Creator Academy to successfully be a six-figure business by itself. The membership portion of that is $5,000 a month. So that's half of your 10000 right there if you do it correctly. A lot of you could be having $99 a month, $1,000 a year programs, depending on what you're offering. But you have to build the value into it to justify that. That makes sense based on what it offers and what it achieves and how that can be something that your community has a desire and a demand for. Then at that point, it's just a matter of getting to your uh, 100 true fans, like initially. For Now, we say 1,000 true fans, but you could, you could even look at 100 true fans and go, wait a minute. If my value ladder is high enough, 100 true, 100 true fans, if the value ladder is high enough, is $100,000 a year. At that point, a thousand true fans is much more than that. <laughs> so just kind of keep those things in mind. A thousand true fans is also a hundred thousand dollars a year, but the value ladder would be a hundred dollars. So that's a pretty low value ladder for a yearly commitment. A hundred dollars a year is not a big investment. Don't get me wrong, it's a lot, it's good, but that's not as high as you can go. You just have to create more value. So if your value ladder has a one hundred dollar buy in, that's great. Thousand true fans. $100 buy-in, microtransactions of $10 to get there, $20, $30 to get there. Sure, that could be your value ladder. That could be how you do the pricing. But if you have a even, oh, my value ladder doesn't end at $100. My value ladder goes so high that it could be $1,000 if someone has that to spend with me. Or it could be $5,000 if they're a high roller has to spend with you. It doesn't have to be everybody. There could be a combination of where, let's say you had a thousand true fans. Let's say you had a thousand true fans, right? Out of those thousand true fans, maybe 10 of them are high rollers and 10 of those 1,000 true fans. If you had a $5,000 offer, they would pay it. So those 10 people are $50,000 of your pipeline because you didn't put a limit on their budget and they had it. But they represent 1% of your community, the top 1% of your community. The top 1% of your community could be $50,000 in value. It could be half of the money that you think you could make could come from 1% of the people that are your true fans. And no one will talk about this. No one, no one talks about it because it sounds absurd. It may even sound greedy to some people. I disagree because it's not about whether the people at the bottom can afford that. You have things for them. That's why... I believe you should have $10 offers. And then, of course, you have free stuff. You have $0 offers. So you can have 0 to $10 offers if the majority of people in your audience were like broke college students. That's fine. But don't set a limitation on the person that doesn't notice or flinch at spending $1,000 with you. Don't decide for them what they can afford just because they're the minority of people. They might want to do more. They might feel they got that value from you. They might want that. So if they can do it, they will. And it's okay if that's just the minority 1% of them. Because like I said, if there is a $5,000 offer besides brands, because that's also the other relationship. The other relationship is, okay, well, what's the ceiling that I can go in with a brand? That's why I have – there's an opportunity for a brand to have a six-figure relationship with me because why would I cut them off of the knees and say – Oh, there's no six figure option to work with me, brand. There's like, no, there's a six figure relationship there. There's up to an easy, like, quarter million relationship if you want it. You want to give me a quarter million dollars for a brand relationship for 12 months for a year? Okay. I'm not going to talk you out of it. Like, that's fine. So, what I'm getting at is again, this gets into absurdist territory, but to bring it back down to earth, 10 people in your audience might have deep pockets and might say, you're the only person I actually really feel invested in this community that's respected me and given me any kind of care as a consideration as a human being. So they might be able to invest $1,000, $5,000. But if all you offer is $100 worth of stuff, you'll never know that. You'll never know that. So it's up to you to kind of figure out, well, what can I offer that's worth it to that person? Um, or that they would just be happy to invest in me in that way and I gave them an option to do it or a way to do it that makes sense for them. So um, that's where 
you know, your 1,000 to 5,000 rate range goes in. It's for the 1%. It's for those 10 out of 1,000 fans. And then that gives you the opportunity for them to be, um, you know, 10 to $50,000 of your pipeline. And so then, oh, wow, making the other 50,000 doesn't seem so hard now. And if you have the bottom of the ladder, let's say at the bottom of the ladder of your 1,000 true fans, the cap for those people spending with you is like $10 a month, $100 in a year. It's fine if 50% of them, all that's all they can afford because at $100 and it's 500 of them, that's still 50,000 there. So that's your other 50,000, that's your 100,000 there. And that's with you having enough opportunities for them to do 10 to $20 microtransactions 10 to five times a year to get there. And that's why you might want to build a product ecosystem to where the broader the base is, the more product there needs to be. So that's merchandise that feels collectible and doing drops and doing things there, you know, $10, $20 in profit, things like that. Um, could even be fan funding stuff like the super chats and what have you. So then, um, you know, being able to exchange that value at scale, it's like, okay, 500 people in my audience that, you know, do enough 10 and $20 transactions over the course of a year adds up to $100, $100 times 500 people ends up being, you know, your 50,000 because 10 of them would be, um, or it's something like that. Is it 50,000? No, it's, um, no, I think that might be, oh, wait, let me do the math again. If it's $100, I think 100 times 500, I want to say that, yeah, that's the 50. Thousand, yeah, I'm doing the right math, right? So yeah, that's a fifty thousand, but it's in micro increments. It's ten to twenty dollar increments. So that means okay, I have to have enough low ticket items between ten, twenty, thirty dollars that make it worthwhile for them to make it easier to climb to a hundred dollars in the course of a year. And then okay, so that's your broad base of those true fans. They did what they could for you, but it's enough because okay, so the bottom is worth fifty thousand and the top is worth fifty thousand. We still have the middle as well and the middle could be worth more and the middle could be another 400 plus people that maybe are somewhere between a hundred and a thousand but less than that let's split the difference let's say that they're all willing to go in on um you know several transactions that end up being an average of 300 dollars for you they're another hundred and twenty thousand dollars right there so do you see what i'm getting at and that this is all about having enough to offer and that's just on again you can do that with physical merchandise if it's collectible in a way you can do that with having a massive amount of books if you write enough books if you write enough books that happens and if you do it in every format and they're collectors, they'll get the paperback, they'll get the audiobook, they'll get the hardcover. Oh, well, all of a sudden, those transactions are adding up. And then if you have multiple books, I literally just ordered every single book that Brandon Sanderson has ever written. I'm a big fantasy fiction guy. I just ordered every single book that I haven't read from Brandon Sanderson for my library downstairs to sit there in honor on my bookcase of Mr. Sanderson has his own shelf on my bookcase. Mr. Sanderson has his pride of place. David Gemmel has his own pride of place. Miss Elizabeth Hayden has her own pride of place. Um, Michelle Sagara is going to have her own uh, shelf soon because she's written 19 uh, books in one series. Uh, Marita, Maria V. Snyder is having pride of place because of the study series, the glass series, and then there's a true other series she wrote that I uh, didn't realize she wrote. So she's a pride of place because she has like 15 books, 16 books. So she gets a whole shelf to herself. See, I'm a collector, right? I'm talking about how I invest in the authors that I care about. They're extracting um uh, easily in the pricing ladder somewhere between 100 and 300 for me depending on how many books they wrote <laughs> you write enough books you'll get roberto's money so like you write 15 books and roberto decides i'm buying every hardcover you write 15 books 30 dollars a hardcover i'm in for a penny i'm in for a pound you've extracted 500 dollars in value from mr roberto you see what i'm saying um that's that's the thing about having enough offers and a lot of people don't realize this. So there's enough offers for those people who will go deep. Now, not everyone will do that. And not everyone will do it in one shot. Like I'm doing it in one shot. There's some people though, they might buy a book a month. So then it's stretched out through the year, right? They might buy something once a quarter in a drop. 
Okay, but stretch that through the year. It's 30 bucks a quarter, four quarters in the year, 120 bucks. I mean, so I think you guys kind of get where I'm going is that we can literally reduce the amount of money that we want to earn into mathematical equations that ultimately determine um, the impact of building a trusted community of a thousand true fans and how we um, approach it. So, you know, that that's how we could look at it. And we can make a reasonable determination about that. And we can do this by not just having one type of way we earn income. We can figure out the income for here's what I can earn in AdSense. Here's how many brands I can do and do 2,000 a month, 1,000 a month with brands. If you get four or five brands that you have great relationships with, you do UGC for them. And even if all you got was you were only able to say, Roberto, I'm not like you. I can't charge that. Okay. But if you have four or five brand relationships and you get them to 1,500 a month, to a thousand to two thousand dollars a month, that's a hundred thousand a year because you're making about eight grand a month, eight to ten grand a month. So you're doing it, and then you still have AdSense, and you still have affiliate links, and you still can sell products, and you can still do membership stuff on Patreon or your own website. So it is possible to do this, and if you don't have big numbers to get sponsorship on your channel. Remember, you can be a UGC creator, you can be a user-generated content creator and ask the brand, how many deliverables do you need on your social media from me for me to get 1,500 or 2,000 a month? I'll do it. Do that contract and package over and over with three, four, five brands Set up long-term six to 12-month contracts. Maybe it starts with a three-month contract, then you get to a six-month, then a 12-month. You do that, you are set. You're a full-time creator, and your channel doesn't even have to be big if the content quality is so good that a brand wants that content quality for their own website or their own social media. So you sign that deal. You ask them for an affiliate link for your channel and to give a discount coupon or code for your channel, now you're double dipping and you're getting a monthly salary basically from the brands and you're getting commissions on sales on your own channel from the affiliates and then you're still monetized with AdSense. That's how you make 10,000 a month. So creatively miss me, decorating on budget says, question Roberto, if you have one channel monetized and your second channel is almost there, but I'm assuming the same email address to set them up, well, you have to fill out the forms again. No, um, you just have to activate the monetization on that channel. You will not, and that channel will have to go through an approval process, but you will not have to resubmit the forms and such all over again. It's just a matter of vetting that channel's approval for the partner program. So again, you 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 hit the apply in the back end of YouTube. You go through that process again, but you don't have to fill out the AdSense forms and the tax stuff all over again. It's just a matter of it's connected to your account through um, the Gmail stuff. So now it's just a matter of submitting the application for that channel only. You don't have to fill out the AdSense paperwork again or none of that. So um, all you're doing is getting that channel approved and reviewed. It's going to the re it's the application for review. And then when you do that and it gets approved, you're good to go. You don't have to do anything else, really. The main thing is you might have to manually turn on ads on your pre-existing videos on that channel. Um, but that's what you'd want to do. The lady right says, listening, lurking, and hitting the like button. Yeah, make sure all of you um, hit the like button for the YouTube algorithm. It does help. SMA Sky says, question, Roberto, to go along with the question about getting monetized and setting up AdSense, would you recommend protecting your idea by getting a P.O. box or business address to put on the AdSense form? It depends. Um, it depends because there may be some physical verification process. So you will want it to be a physical address you have access to in terms of a business address. But yes, to protect your identity a little bit more, that is ideal. Um, that is ideal and look into things like a virtual address that can help for those concerned about anonymity to an extreme. Absolutely. Um, so I would agree with that. Uh, I also recommend not registering your LLC using your home address. I would use a virtual address and a business address and uh, not your personal home address. 
Zolo Q says, hey, I will have to come back and rewatch the stream later. Roberto's streams are like a class for me. Every class is unskippable. Thank you for all you do. Thank you. I appreciate that. That's actually my goal with these. My goal is basically to do this as a combination of somewhat classroom, workshop, and podcast format uh, for some kind of immersive learning experience. And so class is in session Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, usually around 6.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. You have Modization Mondays as a class. So that's for the people who want to make money, be a full-time content creator. Workshop Wednesdays, when we talk about practical things and we're trying to get you through processes, systems, tutorials. So that could be thumbnail editing, video editing. It could be um, doing research. It could be title formulation. It could be any of those things. And then we have FAQ Friday, where I answer all the questions that come in. We also talk more about analytics in that. We deep dive into strategy and ideation. Um, so it's it's a lot. It's a lot. And I can't wait FAQ Friday just because it kind of fits the alliteration. So we have Modization Wednesday. Sorry, Modization Monday, Workshop Wednesday, FAQ Fridays. So Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Um, and that's how we uh, feed the content schedule. Hey, what's up, Dan? Appreciate you. Dan Courier, Creator Fundamentals, friend of the channel. Lakeside Production says, thank you for all the free info and knowledge, Roberto. It's uh, appreciated um, from Santa Semen. Thank you so much. Appreciate you. Uh, you know, and I also like to use this as a way for people to understand the depth of information that I can provide because then it shows, all right, if we do coaching, he'll go over the analytics. He'll deep dive into the data. He'll look at this. Oh, he's answering all these questions and he definitely knows what he's talking about. There's things like that. Oh, we have people who've worked with them come through the stream and they're singing his praises. Like, so there's a there's a there's a logic behind all this. I don't believe that my free content and my paid coaching compete with each other for a very simple reason. General advice is not the same thing as me looking at your data, looking at your circumstances, looking at how many hours a week you have after you work, looking at what your situation is, what your living situation is, and saying, okay, you need a quiet place to film. Here's how you do this. Here's how you use the public library to get a quiet place to film. Or, hey, oh, this is what's going on with your acoustics. Well, here's the soundproofing you need to buy. And the, oh, this is your bottleneck on your editing software. Transfer to this editing software. Do this, do this, because you have these problems. Oh, yeah, don't go and buy a NAS unless you do this, do this, do that. So I can look at an individual career specific circumstances, and I can give even more detail and more specific than looking at um, someone at a glance that I'm not spending a 90 minute going back and forth in conversation with. I can do so much more for a creator one on one. So I don't feel like the free stuff competes. And then in terms of anything behind a paywall, the thing with that is um, anything behind a paywall in terms of information, I don't have to cater to the YouTube algorithm. So that's going to be different. The other thing is I have other formats and resources I can do. So um, I believe that when I do finally do the $600 courses, I just still feel it'll be radically different than what I do with YouTube because it still will be less general than people think because there is a qualifier that changes with not only paying for something, but the fact there's no algorithm to dictate the approach, the packaging, the time, this or that. I try not to drag things out as it is, but there is things with the algorithm that dictate the editing style of a YouTuber, their approach, the cadence, the communication. When something's a course, I don't have to cater to YouTube. I can only cater to the um, person paying me. I can cater to the student, and that's different than if you do public content, it has to be for public consumption. Paywalled content is the definitive vision that the creator had if they're not beholden to what a platform's rules are, advertiser rules, brand perception, uh, culture of how content is being consumed in their niche. I just believe that for education-based channels, and maybe half of you watching our education-based channels, actually, I want you all to think about that as well. What would be different about your content if there were no algorithm determining how it's perceived, how it's promoted, and how it's viewed? How would you approach content in a world where algorithms don't exist? That's what your paywall content is. Your paywall content is you no longer being beholden to platforms, algorithms, advertisers, or brand perception, and only delivering value on exclusively a covenant between you and the person paying for that content. 
And I, and I really believe in that's a different mindset shift. I don't think that the social media platforms want us thinking quite in that way because that's a little more independent and it doesn't fit their model or give them a cut of the revenue if we start thinking more along those lines. I'm not saying don't ever make free content. I'm saying that you should never be thinking that your free content competes with your paid content. It doesn't. They're completely different psychologies, number one. And number two, algorithmless content versus algorithm-driven content are vastly different, in my opinion. Uh, Better Basketball Training says, hey, Roberto, this is such a good live. I've not yet enabled memberships on my channel because I don't know what tiers to offer to start building memberships. Okay, so for those of you who are content creators doing YouTube channel memberships, one of the things you need to account for is that YouTube takes 30% of the membership revenue. Then on what's left, you're going to be taxed. And you're going to be taxed to the tune as a self-employed person about 20 to 30% on the revenue left. So let me put it to you like this. Let's say just for the sake of argument to make the numbers easy. Let's say you had a $10 membership. YouTube takes 30%. You're left with $7. Of the $7, let's say the government tax is 20% of that. So the government's going to take a buck 40 from you. So now you're down to... $5.60. So you started out getting $10 per member. Okay. Now you're down to $5.60 because YouTube takes their cut and the government takes a cut of what's left. Now, 20% is a pretty reasonable tax rate to assume for a self employed person. Because if you guys didn't know, as a 1099 contractor with Google LLC through its subsidiary, YouTube, LLC, you're a 1099 contractor, you're self-employed, which means you're beholden to a self-employment tax of 15%. And you have to pay FICA and all these things, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, all these things. And then you have state and local, uh, sorry, you have state local taxes. If you're in New York or California, you might have some city municipal taxes on top of that. And you have federal taxes as well. In aggregate, your effective tax rate is unlikely to be less than 20%. It's most likely going to be 25 to 35% to be honest with you, but let's just lowball it and call it 20. If YouTube takes, if on a $10 membership, YouTube takes 30%, you're at $7 out of 10. If the government takes 20% of the $7, they're taking a dollar and 40 cents. They take a dollar and 40 cents. Now you're down to $5 and 60 cents. So now out of your, um, out of your $10, you're down to $5 and 60 cents you're down to about 55% of what you were supposed to be paid. So I want you to price these things in to your brain when you guys are thinking about how much to charge for something. So when you charge, by the way, for your um, merchandise, you have your cost. You might charge $20 for a hoodie, but you have your cost. You're not going to make $20. You have your cost for just having the hoodie and doing the design and the print on demand company and the shipping and all of that. So if your margin on that hoodie that you charge $20 for is let's say you 50%, you charge 20 for the hoodie, you made 10. And or, and it's probably it's not a hoodie, it's most likely a t-shirt, let's be real. So if it's a t-shirt or a hat and you charge 20, but your profit margin is 10, well, okay. The government's going to come and now take 20% of that. So now you're down to $8 off of the $20 purchase, which isn't bad. It's still money. It's bad, but you're still not getting even half of it at that point. So I just want you to be aware that you have to figure in the cost of doing business and then the taxes on profit into how much money you actually are making when you decide, hey, what is my price for something, okay? Then you also have to consider, well, what's the value to the consumer? If you charge a premium for your merchandise, then use the premium um, use the premium materials, but increase the margin slightly because, okay, it's the best printed materials. Pay into your cost, one-time cost, to have a really good designer. Find a really good designer on Upwork or Fiverr for your merchandise, 
pay one time for that cost, but then make a design that translates to as many products as possible so that people want more of these products and matching. Maybe pay an extra fee for variants from your designer so they can do variants of a design all at once so you have more options and versatility for your merchandise. So bulk order the designs from the graphic designer and the artist and then translate that across multiple products. So you have a one-time fixed cost built in. You know you need to make that to break even. You have a better chance of breaking even because you can sell bigger quantities and collections of product. So then that helps a little bit. Use premium materials to justify increasing the price, which then also you can increase the margin on that. And then that helps significantly. Um, so you need to price in, again, I don't know what creators are going to talk to you about this, about, well, how much, why do you charge this for your merch? How do you rationalize paying for the designs? How do you handle this? What's the profit margin? Profit margin for me on books is the same on merchandise, but I sell far more books than I do merchandise. Why? Education versus entertainment. As an entertainer, you can show, um, you can sell your lifestyle, your merch, and your identity as an entertainer to fans of yours. If you are an educator, and or even an edutainment channel, you sell utility. And utility comes in the forms of books, uh, courses, digital downloads, or access to your knowledge. So um, you then price accordingly. Digital has better margins than physical items. The, uh, when I sell a book for a uh, print book for $14, Amazon takes a 30% cut after cost. Cost is $3.50 per book, right? So basically, you can always round it up to like, Four bucks, okay? There's sales tax, so there's that. So the government takes their pound of flesh as well there. So it's basically down, okay, we're now down to like $10 in profit. Amazon gets 30% of that profit. I make about roughly just about, just barely $7 per book, but I'm charging 15. So basically my effective margin based on the sales price you pay versus what I deal with after the sales taxes are taken out and then what Amazon takes out, I'm down to about 50%. I'm down to about $7 for every $15 book I sell. But wait, there's more. The government comes and takes another 20% from me after the profits. So there you have it. So after the government takes their pound of flesh, I'm back down to about $5.50 a book. So that means I effectively make about one-third of what you wanted to pay me because... Everybody has to take their cut, right? Um, and that's how business works. But a 35% margin a profit is normal or extremely good for physically based um, businesses selling products. So don't get it twisted. And I'm not whining. I'm just telling you how it is and that you're, I want to give you reasonable perceptions, even as a digital entrepreneur in the space, reasonable perceptions of profit. So again, you end up in a similar scenario on the pricing that I just gave you. When you do a membership with YouTube, because YouTube takes 30% off the top, then you're going to be taxed 20% um, on what's left. And so then that's your price. So when it comes to memberships, here's my thought. Depending on what you guys offer, I think a $9 to $12 single membership tier is good or even having a, let's say, if you want people to just support you, you can have a just support me tier, and that just support me tier could be $3. You can have a just support me tier of $3 because after everything's all said and done, that's basically people giving you a buck fifty a month. And it's not nothing. Because if a thousand people gave you a buck fifty a month, it's fifteen, you know, it's fifteen hundred dollars a month. That's about twelve thousand dollars. No, sorry, it's more than twelve thousand. It's about seventeen thousand dollars a year. Um, so not bad, not bad at all. Um, $17,000 a year. If you have a thousand true fans and the profit margin on $3 a month ends up being 150 after tax, then after tax, you end up at a place where it's about roughly, you make about 17,000 extra a year off memberships. That's not bad at all, but that's a just support me. Thank you tier. And they don't really get that many perks for that. They get icons. They get a little, you know, like, thank you. And access to a members only live stream, right? So that's the $3 model. But the second tier, if you're going to do two tiers, I believe you have a $3 model. And then I would say maybe you have a $9 or $12 model 
which then is the real exclusive content besides members only live streams. And so what that would be is the exclusive members only content. Maybe that's a once a week video and a once a month members only live stream. And the people at the very bottom tier get access to participate in the members only live streams. But the people paying the nine dollars a month to support you or whatever, they're getting that. Now, why? Why? What's my reasoning behind that? Because at the nine dollar tier, after YouTube takes 30 percent and you're basically getting about roughly six bucks and then the government comes in again, blah, 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 you're making about four, four or five bucks. You're making about you know, like four bucks. You're making about four bucks. So at four bucks a pop after that, if you're making extra content for these people once a week, these people are effectively paying you a dollar per video. I think your time is more valuable than a dollar per video. So what happens? It has to scale to where you have to have like a few hundred real fans or a hundred real fans to make that valuable. Because if you have a hundred fans paying you a dollar per video, then you know, okay, well, at least I'm making a hundred dollars per private video for my community. I can justify putting effort into that. Then you have the members only live streams. And then those people might be so grateful that they also have more intimacy with you and they super chat. So that's my thesis. I believe maybe in a $3 tier and a $9 tier would be ideal. And I think those two binary options of $3 and $9 increases the amount of people who do something. I actually believe in two tier systems for um, purchasing sometimes. So that's why I believe in a three and a $9 because the choice now becomes price anchoring and becomes binary. And the gap between the offerings is significant enough. Say, well, if I was going to support somebody, I'll do it in this way versus that way. And I think I'm getting enough for that. So I think that that uh, justifies it. It's not about comparing it to, well, what is Netflix class or whatever? Because you're not Netflix. The difference is the access to you, the intimacy of supporting a creator directly, that relationship, that transaction is more than just a transactional relationship. It's a commitment of support and it's an acknowledgement and that's something they can't get from a company like netflix right so there's an emotional investment not just a financial one so then i would say that the members only access to a live stream creates the deeper level of connection intimacy and exclusivity so i believe you sell exclusivity and that's how you would approach it right um because exclusively exclusivity equals intimacy and also equals status and also equals community AK just us. So that's why I believe in that. And that's why I would price at those things for YouTube channel memberships. Now at scale, what that looks like for us getting to, let's say $10,000 a month, I'll be real with y'all. A lot of you gonna need 3,000 to 5,000 members if you're only pricing at three to $9 because of what I talked about with YouTube taking their 30%. So you have to account for that 30% uh, cut off. And then realistically, I kind of still want to deal with the tax implications. So another 20% afterward. So that's why I said what I said. And that's why, okay, what if I want to make that with channel memberships? Now, channel memberships are different. And we're going for YouTube wise, we're going to move to subscribers only because now we're going to use the stream to boost the subscribers. Uh, so if you've been subscribed for one minute, you can actually be in the chat. If you're not subscribed, subscribe to the YouTube channel. Um, so yeah. So what uh, what I would do is on the memberships and thinking about this, you also would want to promote the memberships in your YouTube community tab. This is a strategy that works very well. And you also want to make a member's trailer, tell people what they get, so on and so forth. So uh, these tactics actually would play out for you. But like I said, um, for the numbers that we're talking about, you need a massive amount of membership, which would mean uh, to get to $10,000 a month in memberships with YouTube and with them taking 30%, you need to have um, 3,000 to 5,000 members to account for the profit margin on YouTube. Now, and then the taxes. Now, if you have your own membership community like what I do um, for Kajabi, once you have a 29 59 or 99 dollar a month membership of your own the number of people you need to make a uh, 10k a month or 100k a year comes down significantly um so like with me and yes this live stream will uh stay up this li my live stream stay up i keep my live streams up you guys can go to the live tab and see my whole archive of these these are basically free courses in a way so you can look at these as um, um a lo-fi version of free courses so what happens 
in this scenario with the memberships. Um, I'm it's gonna be a bear to timestamp these uh later, by the way. But what happens with this is if you had your own membership, yes, you pay a fee with something like Kajabi, but think about it. With Kajabi, my price stays the same, which means my profit margin only increases. That's why I do it. So imagine if I was charging $99 a month for a membership. That's great. Let's say I was making $100,000 a year on membership, but I did it all through YouTube. YouTube would take 30%. Now I'm down to $70,000 a year out of the $100,000 you guys wanted me to have. Okay, but YouTube's facilitating it and everything. Well, it's not doing that much. Okay. Then after that, I have to pay taxes on that. So if my tax rate is effectively 20%, then I pay 14 grand on taxes. So now $70,000, which is still grateful, still good money, would now become $56,000. So now out of $100,000 that you worked for, earned, blah, 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 you're down to $56,000. Now, what would happen differently if I used Kajabi for a $99 a month membership and I was making $100,000 a year? Well, with Kajabi, shout out to our sponsor, Kajabi, the way that that would work is no matter how much money I make, my cost would never increase. So let's say my cost, let's say it was um, the $200 a month plan. So that's uh, $2,400 a year. So it's $2,400 a year. Well, out of my $100,000, that means that I'm still keeping over 99. Like, sorry, well, no, sorry, I mistake. I keep 97,000 of that. Let's just round it to $3,000 that they take. Let's just give them a tip. They took 3,000 from me. Instead of YouTube taking 30,000 from me, they would take 3,000 for me. Okay, cool. I have 97,000 left. So then when the government takes 20%, bleh, they're taking about 18 grand. So now, you know, I'm down to 79,000 instead of 56. That's a really big difference. It's a really big difference to be at 79,000 profit instead of $56,000 profit. That's why I like fixed cost. I do not love revenue sharing, to be honest with you, to some degree. There are things I do like revenue sharing on. Ad revenue makes sense. YouTube's facilitation on the ad revenue, justified. Mm, not as much for me on memberships, though. Not for the limitations and the lack of options. I'd rather pay. It exists because not everyone can or is willing to pay up front. So they'd rather just see the money come out on the back end, invisible to them, so they didn't come out of pocket because that hurts for creators. So creators actually leave a lot of money on the table because of how much free, 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 no cost up front they're willing to do. They leave a lot of profit on the table, and then they eat taxes on top of that lack of profit for very little, in my opinion, sometimes, not always, ad revenue being a good example of, yeah, let's go that way. Um, in return. So that's my thesis on. I love YouTube. I love the YouTube partner program. I just think that 30% on memberships, 30% on super chats, 30% on donations is extreme. But Twitch is worse with it being 50%. And then you're taxed on top of that. So I just don't like situations when you end up with half of what you were looking to make or less. I just don't like that. That's just my personal take on it based on the numbers and based on the math. And I just want to make your expectations clear because this is why the money that creators make sounds better than it is sometimes. It sounds better than it is because everyone will talk about their income. Everyone will talk about their revenue, but not their net income or net profit after it's all said and done. That's where I think that transparency can be better and should be better. And that's what I like to do on Monetization Mondays. Um, that's why I think it's important um, to talk about that. And I, I think that it's a lot of people who don't know any better and they get really excited about this and, oh, I make it. And then they get hit with a tax bill they are not expecting. Like they are not expecting that tax bill and it hurts. It hurts a lot. Just look at what math I explained to you. Imagine getting excited and saying, oh, wow. I made $100,000 this year. Oh, wow. And then you look at, oh, wait, well, YouTube, actually, no, I don't make that. YouTube takes this. Okay, okay, well, I'm still doing good. I'm still doing good. Oh, wow. There's another 20%. Oh, wow. 
So I made half of what I earned. It's still a lot of money and I'm grateful and I'm doing what I love, but half of what I earned, uh, that hurts. It just personally hurts. And so um, I saw a lot of creators experience this for the first time during the pandemic. And they were like, Roberta, what the hell, man? I didn't think that uh, taxes was like this. Why didn't nobody warn me? It's like, well, I made a video about it. Like, come on, guy. I made a YouTube taxes video. I made more than one of them. Like, what What do you mean you didn't watch it? Um, like, well, I, I just thought I'd be like being an employee. And I just, you know, blah, 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 or whatever. It's like, no, my friend, no. 15% self-employment tax off rip. So it's, um, you know, it's significant. And a lot of people just don't. Um, look into it, and then they're surprised when they get hit with it. And it's really tragic for a lot of them because a lot of them don't save up for it. And sometimes you have a bad account. Back in the days before I started using Bench, I'm still paying back taxes because I had like a bad account in one year. And then it was the year that I tried to file everything myself. So it's like I had to then get real accountants, and I'm still paying from back taxes from being a smaller creator. So, but hitting those first years, you know, where I started making really good money. And stopped filing at H&R Block because I all the way up into making six figures, I was still filing at H&R Block. And then after a while, I was like, OK, this is getting too complicated for them. They started telling me it was getting too complicated for them. So and I wasn't saving any money. And so, you know, it, it just became a thing and I had to upgrade um, and it can be overwhelming. And it can also make hurt your feelings when you're like, oh, I earned all this money. I worked for all this money. I don't feel like. I got that much help or support along the way. And where was the support, supposed support when I was struggling? When you realize that, okay, I have the same lack of support struggling and the same lack of support successful, but then I'm the one being asked to make the most contributions and sacrifices, that starts to really mess with you as a creator. And people don't talk about it because it makes them seem petty or insecure or ungrateful or privileged. But if you're living through it, and you remember what your struggles were like and that you weren't getting support and then you make all this money and then it just feels like everyone has their hands out afterward. It really does just hurt your feelings and make you feel like you're a commodity and it dehumanizes you. And I don't think people respect that idea because they're still on the struggle bus themselves. But once they graduate, if they ever do, it'll be their turn. And then they'll be like, oh, and I can't talk about it because no one's going to feel sorry for me. So it's just the thing. So Clover Tack. With the $5 Super Chat, appreciate you, and thanks for being on admin duty, Clover, um, says, one, get over the stigma of creators making money. Two, know your worth, even if you're a small channel. Three, don't leave anything on the table. Kachin, couldn't agree more. Bruh. Could not agree more. I, I love that. Um, thank you for that, Clover. Katie Ukulele says, whoa, that just set a few things into mind for me. I've been heavily wanting to drop the instruction and do only songs, cover original. I have some things to think about, regular algorithm content versus non-algorithm content. Yeah, just like start thinking about it. Start uh, changing your mindset. Uh, Katie Ukulele says, I've always heard to hold 30%, even if it's lower than that, roll over to the remainder into the next year's. That is a good uh, frame of reference. That's good advice. Now, what I was referring to is the effective tax rate when they reconcile it versus the um, what I think they call the marginal tax rate. So there's a difference between the marginal tax rate and then what your effective tax rate ends up being. But holding 30% or calculating 30% in is just good advice. But yeah, if you end up at that 30% thing, it hurts even more what I was talking about. 20% is being modest and you see how egregious it still is. Um, I'd like us to go to 10%, but again, politics will never let us do that. So it's whatever. We'll never get to that 10% that I think, um, we should just won't ever happen. But I think the 10 is fair for everybody. Um, exactly how I've heard it, a separate account just for taxes. Yes. You always want to do a separate account just for taxes. Absolutely agree with that. Yep. I agree with that. And again, I always believe in talking to a professional about that. Um, you know, get a CPA, uh, get a bookkeeper, um, those kind of things. The lady right says, "Do early access memberships work for YouTube? I've seen them work in some niches. I think they do really well." with people who do documentary style content, true crime, for example, 
um, so on. Oh, someone asked earlier if I do if I've uh, coached and worked with faceless channels. Um, I do. I actually have worked with multiple faceless channels. Uh, I coach about 40 gamers a year from Supercell. A lot of them are faceless YouTubers. A lot of gamers are faceless YouTubers. I've coached gamers outside of that. They're faceless YouTubers. I've coached um, some very successful. I won't name them uh, because I've seen their identity in their face, but I have coached some commentary uh, channels that are faceless whose identity still haven't been revealed or some who have, who knows, but I've coached some faceless commentary channels over a million subscribers. You probably know them if I hinted beyond that. So I won't, but I've, I've, I've coached faceless million subscriber YouTube channels before I've coached faceless, small creators before I've coached some creators who started faceless, who are now faces. And even though I wasn't faceless, faceless, my tutorial content was faceless for the big part of my early career on YouTube. My face was out there, but I just didn't for uh, tutorial content. I didn't show my face. I didn't think it was relevant to the videos. So I've done faceless content and got hundreds of thousands of views per video on faceless videos that I made with no face of mine in the video. Um, so on those tutorials, hundreds of thousands of views in the early Premiere Pro and Photoshop videos. I've done like hundreds of tutorials um, I've gotten dozens of videos that are faceless with hundreds of thousands of views each on them. So I've done that. And then I've worked with faceless creators that are significant, especially in the gaming space and the commentary space and in some other niches, but mostly gaming and commentary and things like that for faceless channels, a couple of docus, true crime channels as well. <clears throat> Divine Chef says, I'm going to wait on my YouTube membership. I will be setting up a coaching call with you, Roberto. Divine Chef, just remember, since you're an awesome creator academy, you're in the pro group. You do get a discount on the one when coaching calls. We will be changing how those discounts go. So get in while it's good. But yeah, absolutely. Looking forward to it. Live production and tips and tools says, thanks, Roberto. You are the man. Yeah, no problem. So Blaz says, it sure is a big difference. I like how you broke that down. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it is a, it's a big difference. I mean, it, it hurts so much. I mean, um, I'm not going to lie. I had a very different view of a lot of these things before I started really seeing what it takes to be a business owner, what it takes to be an entrepreneur, what it takes to do those taxes. I pay payroll taxes for my team. And yeah, my team is friends and family, but still I eat taxes on top of taxes. Um, the way I found it, I found out I did this. I did a, I did a chart and I realized something really weird. I did a chart and I realized I get taxed on the same dollar about roughly six times. I get taxed on the same dollar six times. And when I pay that dollar to someone else, they're taxed on it six times. And I and it, I lost my mind. I almost curled up into a ball and cried when I realized this. Um, and no joke. Like, so being a business owner changes your mindset completely about everything after a certain amount of time, obviously, if you're successful at it. More Crazy Wild Fine says, question, where, where would you recommend to get contracts for UGC clients on a budget or free? And would you charge upfront deposit when working with a brand? Well, on charging upfront, you it depends on your relationship with the brand. Um, and in a first time relationship with a brand, um, you know, basically on the first outing with a brand, a lot of times it is necessary, especially if you're a smaller content creator, to be very accommodating. So right out the gate, you, the terms um, have to be very favorable because they do have better options if you have not become a leader in your niche, let's say. If you're not a leader in your niche, a name in your community, you're not established, you're not at a certain level, the brand has other options and they know it. Um, you get more leverage when you're a market leader, when you're one of the top 20 biggest channels in your category. Um, that helps significantly with leverage. When you have no leverage, you give up more. So the party with the most leverage gets the most, obviously. So upfront deposits, not as much of a thing if you're a smaller creator. I hate to say it like that. 
if you're a smaller YouTuber, smaller creator, and by that I mean a channel under 100,000, under 50,000, and I'm sorry to have to tell you this, and this isn't a 100% and fast rule, but it's very rare, very, very rare that you will be able to secure an upfront deposit on a brand that you've never had a working relationship with you because you're a stranger. They got people they're already working with that don't ask for that, that are bigger than you. So that one's rough. That one's rough. You can command that sort of thing when you have much more leverage. I had a brand give me uh, three months in advance, three month advance up front. But that's because I could command that and I worked a decade to command that. And I also came through for them as an affiliate before I became came through on that. So like I did a lot of advocacy for the brand before we ever had a partnership. I also helped give it things that would improve the product before we had a relationship and the brand came to me. So that's why I had that leverage. They came to me, they hunted me down. So that, that gave me the leverage in that situation to command that. So it does happen, but it happens more when you're established or when you're the market leader or you have something that commands that, but very hard to get if you're a smaller content creator under 100,000, under 50,000. Now, if you're over 100,000 and you can say, hey, that's how I work with brands, that's how I roll, then maybe that's the thing. Or if you have established relationship, then maybe. But on a first outing when they don't know you and you're a stranger, very hard to secure that upfront deposit. Now, I'm not saying it never happens. I'm just saying that's very rare, at least when it goes to YouTube. When it comes to YouTube, that's very rare. Now, there are some other places where that's more common. I do find that that can be common for those of you who do Instagram brand deals. And I've done Instagram brand deals like that, even as a smaller content creator. As many of you know, I'm just under 25,000 in Instagram, but I'm OG verified before you could pay for it because I've been on uh, Bloomberg TV. I've had some Wall Street Journal articles about me. I've had like some press like USA Today, Entrepreneur. And I didn't pay for mine. I didn't realize everyone else was paying for theirs. Uh, you know, I still was in my brokey mentality. And to some degree, the early stuff was in my brokey era too. I couldn't buy press if I wanted to. And the packages for that are expensive. I'm like, look, I ain't got that kind of money. Or when I did have that kind of money, I'm like, I'm not spending on that. I'm spending on camera gear. What are you talking about? I'm not gonna pay you for an article. I'm gonna buy a new camera. Um, Because you know me, I love my gear. I have that gear obsession. I have that gas, gear acquisition syndrome. So- for me, I'm like, no, nah, I'm not paying you all that. I'll just go buy another camera. Um, but that's that's how I am. Um, so my press, my press is all free press. That's why I only have but so much of it. Um, because I don't have a publicist and I'm doing pay, I'm not doing pay for play. And again, until Elon, I didn't have to buy any of my verifications. I even OG Twitter verified, I didn't have to buy my uh, stuff. And why do I mention this? It's because there are other platforms where you can get upfront because it's just more traditional to get up front with instagram tiktok is it depends it depends on situations um for getting upfronts on that upfront payments more common in instagram than it is on youtube believe it or not so definitely would say on um, that even for ugc with ugc you can get upfront deposits more in tiktok and in instagram now if you do a multi platform situation with UGC. That's easier to secure upfront payment on when it's multi-platform. Um, it just happens to work that way. It just happens to work that way. YouTube is a little different. But if they are participating in Instagram and TikTok or multi-platform, then those brands that do that tend to be more flexible on things like some version of upfront payment. Sometimes a deposit of 20%, half up front, or a fixed fee, you can do that. I also, for UGC content, would include termination fees in the contract. Now, in terms of getting contracts, you could go to, I think it's a website, I think it's called Creators Legal, and you might be able to find stuff there. For a lot of these, you might want to hire a social media lawyer to help work on this for you. You may want to get a contract from the brand, then modify that contract. Maybe you run it through chat GPT, not legal advice. And so maybe in that direction, it's a good question. It's something I want to cover in the future a lot more. I want to bring on some people who do a lot more. I do UGC, but I do it with brands that I've worked with for a while. Uh, I want to bring on some more people. I could do a panel around UGC 
Um, so at some point I want to bring on like maybe three or four creators, do a creator panel round table, or maybe I'll do one in person at an event. Maybe at VidCon I can wrangle some people because uh, I'm probably going to VidCon with Kajabi. <clears throat> oh, excuse me. And probably Opus. Uh, maybe even StreamYard. Depends on what's going on there. Still working some stuff out there. Um, but what I would say is um, I might put together a UGC roundtable for you. If I can pull it off in person, I will. If I can pull off a UGC roundtable in person, I absolutely will do it. 100% will do it. Um, if I cannot pull off a UGC roundtable in person, I will just do one remotely uh, using StreamYard and get people on it and uh, we'll do it. Um I might do a live version. I might do a not live version. I'm actually willing to do more than one panel for that, to be honest with you. And creator panels, creator roundtables, I want to make creator roundtables a staple of content that I'm going to do. I know that other creators dabble in it, like Colin and Samir from time to time. I want to do more than dabble in it. Yep, no, I agree. Uh, H&R Block can be a financial death sentence for a business. You need a real accountant. Yeah, no kidding. I learned that the hard way, to be honest with you. Thank you to uh, Tantrum Nose uh, for being a new channel member. Um, PSA asks, question, Roberto, quick tips for Shorts Creator. Uh, reference my timeline right now for today on, well, for those of you watching in the future, it's not relevant, but... Um, I will say some quick tips, but I would say reference me and hit me up on Twitter about that because I actually post about that frequently. But I actually did a calculation, and I determined that um, it's very ideal if you've learned to make good YouTube shorts. I did an estimation, and if you make really good YouTube shorts, you should probably just go ahead and post um, three shorts a day. I'm not joking. You should probably just post three shorts a day, and I'm going to tell you why. If every short that you posted only got 10 subscribers, I don't care about views. Screw views. Don't care. If I want to care about subscriber growth, I'm actually – views facilitate subscriber growth. But if I just measure what's the net monthly subscribers a video is getting, I can do a math calculation irregardless of the views, right? I can extrapolate from the views and just do a 100x multiplier using the 1% rule, but I digress – because I'll tell you what's going to happen. So let's say every YouTube short you did, right, got 10 subscribers, no matter how many views it does, right? No matter how many views it does, it gets 10 subscribers per month per video. If you upload three videos a day, then you're getting 30 new subscribers every single day. If you're getting 30 new subscribers every day from every YouTube short that you um, basically post because you're posting three a day, it's going to have this compounding effect over a course of a 12-month cycle because the reality is that, okay, relatively speaking, each of these ones is somewhat diminishing returns based on the calculation because, okay, the first batch – of 90 videos has another 11 months to accumulate more subscribers. So that those 90 videos now are on a countdown of 11 months at 10 subscribers per month per video, 10 subscribers per month per video. Okay. But you have 90 of them. So that's gone. That's massive in terms of the inventory's potential. If they're evergreen shorts, to keep bringing in views. This is why short channels are blowing up, to be honest. It doesn't matter how many views they get. It's that if a shorts creator's content was only good enough to where the short they made got them 10 subscribers a month on just that short, but they got 10 subscribers a month every month from one short, and they're posting three of them a day, then the cumulative compounding 
of all of their YouTube shorts means that the end of a year, if the shorts were only good enough to convert 10 subscribers a month a piece, they still got 70,200 subscribers out of doing it. So the cadence that I believe in minimum for a YouTube shorts creator is three shorts a day, just based on the assumption of that math. Because it means that that creator, I know that that creator can get a silver play button. Now, on the assumption that that creator's content is so good that every YouTube short they post could get 30 subscribers per month per short, posting three shorts a day means that every day that those shorts exist for their life, that the cumulative total of those three shorts a day in their day at 30 apiece, we're delivering 90 subscribers to that creator for that month. And they're doing that on a daily basis. So they're just racking it up, racking it up, racking it up, racking it up. So if their shorts are really good, then that creator is going to get 2,000, sorry, 210,600 subscribers. Yeah, 2,000. Sorry, 210,600 subscribers in 12 months, okay? So based on that, if the creator was so good that every short had the potential to get 100 subscribers and that's it per month over the lifetime of every single month per short, and they're posting three X shorts a day, that have that subscriber potential over the course of a 30 day cycle over the course of 12 months, because it's evergreen shorts. This works for like star Wars, Harry Potter, Marvel anime. This is why these people blow up. It's 700,000 It's 702,000 subscribers in just one year. So now you know why someone can do YouTube shorts every day, three shorts a day, for two or three years and get a million subscribers. Now you know why. Now you know why someone can do YouTube Shorts for two years and get 100,000 subscribers. Now you know. YouTube Shorts nearly doubled in four years the amount of silver play button holders that it took 14 years to accumulate before. So that's how powerful YouTube Shorts are. So my best YouTube Shorts advice is make the best shorts you possibly can and I don't even mean off of repurposed content unless you're a podcaster. Unless you're a podcaster, I don't even mean repurposed content. I'm talking about true YouTube shorts. If you make you true YouTube shorts, and even if all their potential is, is that every short can only gain 10 subscribers for you per month. But it's an evergreen short that can do that all year at a three shorts per day cadence that puts you at 70,000 new subscribers a year just from YouTube Shorts. This is why YouTube Shorts channels explode. Then remember, you're gaining subscribers now. So you might grow in shares, reach, notoriety. So you do this again, next year is exponentially more. So then it increases without even increasing the upload cadence. So that's, that's part of my thesis of YouTube Shorts and its exponential multiplier value off of posting. There is a version of this for regular YouTube videos that worked to some degree. It's actually what worked for me when I did daily videos uh, back in the day. When I did, did daily videos back in the day, I grew by 100,000 subscribers in 16 months, basically 70, 80,000 subscribers in 12 months. But I was posting daily. But I was posting daily. But if I'm posting daily and all I need is 30 subscribers per month per video to average out of daily posting content. You can see exactly why when I used to post daily content, I got to a point to where I was making, like I was doing uh, 100,000 new subscribers a year. That was the reason. If I had kept that up indefinitely and then quality still improved or maintained, um, uh, the, the growth is there. Even now, I look at the numbers. I look at the numbers and even now, um, if I went to daily, the averages I would need to hit per video are not significantly high in order to go back to getting like 100,000 to 200,000 new subscribers in a year. I would just basically have to do daily, regular, edited YouTube videos, uh, potentially, and then off of the mathematical equation for it. Um, I don't actually need to average a high number of views 
to be able to hit a stride with that if I was daily because I did the math on it. I did the math on it and on a 1% multiplier um, because I just basically have to take the number of subscribers that I want to get per video, multiply it by 100 using the 1% rule for regular video uploads, mind you. For regular video uploads, um, for this to work for me, I would only have to average 10,000 views per upload and just upload every seven days. And if I did uh, uh, just 10,000 views per upload because of my conversion rates, because of my conversion rates, if I average 10 to 15,000 views average on every single daily upload in a 30-day period, mind you, not in a week, not a, per upload in a 30-day cycle, but uploading every day a week for seven days, if that worked out, I would definitely grow by a minimum of 100,000 new subscribers a year, but up to a quarter million potential new subscribers per year based purely on the math. If I account, however, for a lower subscriber ratio, it would still grow me by about 80,000 new subscribers um, per year at that cadence, which is still actually significant. And I'm adding that to the amount of growth I get now, by the way. Um, so then that definitely is 100,000 new per year on top of what I'm currently doing. So um, because you have to accumulate, uh, uh, sorry, sorry, you have to apply uh, your existing inventories carry weight to that. There's also a little bit of a bump because of re-upping the new subscribers. So I've reduced the math on this. Um, I've reduced the math on this. And again, you have to tweak this per channel because there are variables that change this per channel. In the gaming niche, the multiplier is not the 1% rule. It gets to about 0.5 for most gamers though because it's harder to get their audience to subscribe. So it's a 0.5 on this. But yeah, the, uh, on an education channel... And on a general YouTube channel or lifestyle channel, it's one um, percent. Could be a one point five or one point eight. My conversion ratio is closer to a one point four, so it's actually above one percent. So that's why I can have lower view thresholds. I can have a lower view floor, convert at a higher rate. Some buy-in and status does um, work for that as well. So social proof can augment some of this. Um, and so by compounding, I could actually achieve this. Um, now, why don't I do that? Burnout will happen inevitably if someone does this, if they don't have help. If you don't have help, doing this leads to burnout. This can largely not be achieved by solo creators. That's why it's not that particular. Why isn't everybody doing this? Why do? Because if you try to do this as a solo creator, you will burn out. Also, quality can suffer as a result of that and a result of burnout and not liking it. You can get bored with your niche very quickly. Um, you can fly too close to the sun, take too many risks. There are so many things that can go wrong with that kind of upload cadence to where it's not viable for most people. So then there's a sweet spot and it's not necessarily quality versus quantity, but it's a balance of the cadence of using a proper ratio for it. And so the most reasonable thing people can do usually is a two to three video a week schedule, but a two to three video a week schedule, non shorts on this usually would, um, in the most realistic outcome, um, get you a uh, most realistic outcome 10 to 30,000 subscribers uh, per year, um, with the optimal amount being at a three video cadence. Now, again, if you were an exception to the rule, 100,000 a year with three video upload cadence. There were years where I could maintain that, by the way. There were years where that worked out for me. But yeah, um, that'd be the best case scenario, but the most realistic version of a three, the most realistic version of a three video per week cadence tends to be 10,000 new subscribers in a year to 30,000 new subscribers in a year based on numbers. Um, for a two video per week cadence for regular YouTube videos, most realistic outcomes are uh, 6,000 to 18,000 in a year. Uh, that's what started for me, by the way. Well, but that, well, actually, even with one video a week, the most realistic thing that happened to me with one video a week was hitting about 11,000 subscribers, which is realistic. That's that's up. That's like pretty up there. That's pretty good. Most realistic version of doing one video a week is 3,000 subscribers in a year. Maybe you get to 9,000, 10,000 in a year. Outlier performance there would be 30,000 in a year doing one video a week. You're killing it. 
true outlier, you're killing it, you're going viral type levels would be posting one video a week and getting 100,000. That doesn't happen for most people. Didn't happen for Ali Abdal. Didn't happen for Graham Stephan. They were much closer to that um, range of, okay, I posted one video a week. I did 10,000 uh, new subscribers in my first year, blah, blah, blah. And so then when they moved to things like um, a two video, three video a week, week cadence Graham and Ali did a three video week cadence for a very long time. And that was a 10,000 to 30,000 a year when they started, then they blew up with that cadence and got to the, um, you know, 100,000 per year growth, 300,000 per year outlier growth for them, because they never stopped. And so they hit that stride in more like year four, year four, they hit the maximum stride in year four, year five of staying with, with the three video upload cadence. Uh, so that's what happened to them. When I moved to the three video upload cadence, I wasn't able to always maintain it. And therefore I moved to the 100,000 range down to about the 60,000 range when I went to two videos a week. And then incrementally, when I went down to like an average of like one video a week, I went down to the 30,000 a year range when I cut the content output by 75% and went to one video a week. That put me at the 30,000 growth per year range. Ramping back up to three to five videos would be the start of going back to the 100,000 new subscriber per year. But seven days a week would put me over the top. Um, but it's a matter of what makes that sustainable. The thing that makes that sustainable is people who have editors. I edit all my own content. Believe it or not, I edit all my own content. Um, so yeah. So again, it would be it would be more um, likely for someone trying to do these things. Um, it would be burnout. Um, that's also one of the things I wanted to avoid, it, which is why I stopped a daily upload cadence. I stopped the daily upload cadence because I didn't feel it would be worth it. Um, to just for the growth, I didn't think it'd be worth it um, because I just didn't value growth enough um, for that to be a mental health problem. Yeah. Uh, Gabe Altier says, Hey, Roberto, when it comes to shorts, do you have insights on how to get better sales conversions? Before they removed the links and comments, sales were insane. Now the product tagging feature just doesn't convert. Consider finding a creative way to wait for it. Find a creative way to use QR codes. Oh, excuse me. Yeah, find a creative way to use QR codes. Bruh. QR codes. We're making QR codes great again, my friends. Um. Yeah, make QR codes great again. Use QR codes, Gabe, creatively in the YouTube shorts to also get people to rewind the shorts, snap the QR code, and use that as a way to get them and to drive sales. Even out of just curiosity, QR codes are back, my friend. So that's my big hack for you. Great question. Great question. Let's see. I think we can go for a few more minutes, but we're not going to go much longer, um, especially since we definitely want to cut this up. I'm going to be right back, everybody. In the meantime, while I'm away, enjoy a little bit of Zen Buster music, uh, copyright free music. Uh, you can go onto Spotify and look for music from Roberto Blake, and you can enjoy some of these tunes um, copyright free. So uh, check that out. I will be back shortly.
hope you guys enjoyed some of those tunes for a little bit and hope you were mesmerized by the animation. I actually did the, well, uh, I purchased a license for the artwork. Then I animated it myself, created the loop, um, which is actually fairly easy enough to do. So I created the loop and then I um, paid to have the music ghost produced and I did all that stuff. So again, that's some of the stuff I did with the Zen Buster uh, music channel. So yeah. Um, uh, yes, I am teaching my brother to edit, but that is a long process to some degree. And then also there are very um, specific um, like things uh, for my editing. And then it's also, we have a workflow for using my network attached storage. So I have a network attached storage over there. It's a Synology NAS. Um, it's um, 64 terabytes, but we do RAID 6. We use RAID 6, which means it's only actually 48 terabytes of actual usage storage because we do RAID 6 uh, for, um, for those of you familiar with how RAID and um, network attached storage works. Everything goes through Ethernet, so it's wired physically throughout the house on the network. So that actually makes the editing workflow for it really solid. And we have gigabit internet for everything, and I paid an absurd amount of money to Best Buy for that to have a uh, wired ethernet and to have three wireless access points. So WAPs, um, we have wireless access points, um, even in studio and library in the basement. Um, the basement still needs its, even though that's where the ethernet is located, they screwed me on that because I told them I want ethernet ports in the basement fixtures and they never did that. So I'm going to eventually circle back with them on that because I need them to do some other things. They also need to label the Ethernet ports and panels and the wiring. It was There's a lot of things that were done halfway, but it was the pandemic and I was already stressed out and it was like whatever. And it was absurd cost, but of, uh, mostly labor, not parts. Long story short is that my editing workflow, as simplistic as it seems, has some things in it and hiccups plus there's green screen so one i've got to get them up to date on adobe 2024 workflows then i have to show them all my presets plugins teach the branding bible that we have for my fonts and colors and all the things and uh so there's a lot of work to do to get that up to a certain point there's also new content formats we're trusting plus green screen so uh yeah but one day one day Um, Lichold says, so Roberto, this would be the perfect content strategy. Three videos a week, eight to 16 minutes. So far, so good. Three shorts a day, one live stream a week in a perfect world where you have the time, energy, bandwidth, resources, and content to facilitate that. Yes. In a perfect world and in a more perfect world, it's also more evergreen as well. And I would argue, actually, in a perfect world, it's not one live stream a week. In a perfect world, it's two live streams a week. In a perfect world, it's two live streams a week. So in a perfect world, it's Monday through Friday. And then, because it's three videos a week. So in a perfect world, I, I think what this look like is Monday, Wednesday, Friday uploads, Tuesday, Thursday live streams, and then daily shorts, three times a day, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. So Monday, Wednesday, Friday, uploads, Tuesday, Thursday, live streams. Then seven days a week, breakfast, lunch, and dinner as far as YouTube shorts. And so that's what I think the cadence uh, would look like in a perfect world. But I do not recommend this for a solo content creator. I recommend that if you were doing this, I would imagine you'd have at least two people helping you. I would imagine you'd have at least two people helping you to pull this off because ideally in that situation you do no thumbnails and you do no video editing and mostly all you do is the uh scripting research content strategy and video performance and run the business and that's enough <laughs> and that's enough so in an ideal world you do no thumbnails and no editing and then this works in an ideal world Yeah, and for most people, if they try to do that by themselves, major, major burnout. But there's ways to do this if you have the help. 
The music was relaxing. Yep, that's the that's the idea. Um, Cacophona says, hey, Roberto, whoever your ghost producer is, they did a great job. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. I will pass that along. Katie Ukule says, I'm currently semi-binging history calling faceless YouTube history of the two-door drama. Yeah, no, I love history. I love faceless channels. Honestly, if I was going to do faceless YouTube channels for myself, and I, I probably will in the near future, to be honest with you, um, to collect data, but also um, they can be great for monetization. There's, I'm a history buff, as many of you know, and uh, as longtime viewers of the live streams. So there are things I would do with um, history, and I would probably do different historical figures. I could do a YouTube channel channel that'd be faceless that's about cryptids and about myths uh mythology magic monsters that sort of thing i could easily love and fall in love with doing that content as a faceless creator i have a strategy that works for it for um regular videos i have a strategy that works for it for shorts uh i could also see myself doing a faceless star wars channel very easily and having unlimited content uh that if i filmed enough of it for that star wars channel the big bottleneck would be the editing there but um the editing would be the big thing but if I did a faceless channel, I, I could see myself doing a bunch of uh, shorts for Star Wars facts and then doing videos that would be long form and doing enough of those to have like, OK, um, like these like long form videos that could work out really well. Some of them could be once a week, some of them be twice a week because I could do things like, you know, uh, complete life or history of this Star Wars character, the complete uh, story of this Star Wars character. Uh, you know, there are different timelines I could do. The complete timeline of the Old Republic, the great uh, complete timeline of the uh, Jedi Sith War, the complete timeline of the Great Hyperspace War, the complete timeline of uh, this, this, that, next, and the other. Um, you know, the complete um, timeline for Ahsoka Tano. Um, I could do all these different things with that that I actually would know about, could do accurately. Um, would people would love it. Um, so I, I know I could pull that off. Um, it's a matter of balancing other priorities, being into it at the time, not burning out, all these other things I could be doing. So, I mean, it's something I would want to do though, eventually, but be, I'd be doing it somewhat seriously, but somewhat hobby. So I could see myself doing that in the future at some point. Um, if I did a Star Wars channel, I'd probably be dedicated entirely to the dark side because that's also another way I would differentiate myself from other channels. Other side of 40, Sista Crystal says, have you ever heard of someone getting their work stolen by an editor? Um, I've heard of editors doing all kinds of shady stuff. Stealing their work? Not particularly. Selling their secrets to their competitors, yes. Selling their secrets to their competitors and selling people to drama channels, yes. World According to Briggs, thank you. Big uh, friend of the channel, World According to Briggs. I'll see you at Vid Summit, uh, if not sooner. Uh, World According to Briggs says, I have a faceless channel called On This Day, this day in history type thing. It has about 40K subs, but has never gained traction even when I was doing five a week interesting okay what i would say is i think you can boost that channel with some short form content my friend i think youtube shorts could absolutely break out and boost that channel i really do Uh, question, Roberto, what would you do if a person, if, what would you do if it were you, a person desperate, have tried everything and it's, and it's going all in on YouTube sh to start over, divorced, lost a bunch of things, has nothing else to lose. Um, okay, so this is a, that would be a sad situation. I probably wouldn't go all in on YouTube, to be honest with you. In that situation, I would probably need to distract myself with something that doesn't have me in my head and has me surrounded with people and doing something physical. So honestly, if, if you get to a situation in life 
where things are desperate, um, you know, and you're depressed, you're divorced, you're sad, um, lonely, and you've lost everything that you've worked for, right? And you and you feel like you have nothing else. In a situation like that, and not to give you like absolute life advice here, but in a situation like that, I think the most important thing in the world is to find a sense of purpose and to not leave that sense of purpose to chance. With YouTube, it's very much judgment based and it's very biased and it's hyper judgmental. People bias your face, your voice. They don't like your voice. So it's hypercritical, hyper judgmental. I wouldn't go all in on YouTube. I wouldn't go all in on YouTube. In fact, in a situation where I feel like that, I might even temporarily suspend or quit YouTube or social media, to be honest with you. I'd probably delete all my social media is what I'd probably do. And or and by delete it, I don't mean delete the accounts outright. I mean, I'd delete it from my phone and not interact with my accounts. I'd pause my accounts, suspend my accounts, whatever, so I don't see the notifications and interactions. And I'd delete it from my phone, but not going and delete my accounts. I'd just delete it from my phone. And by deleting it from my phone and not interacting with it and blocking the websites from my computer at a router level, the reason I say this from a mental health standpoint for somebody in this situation, like um, I'm going to just call you uh, Sam Hardy. So if I was in Sam Hardy's situation, and I don't mean this to be a life coaching moment, and this is just me because he's asking what would I do in this situation? I remember one of the times I was depressed. And I remember that one of the most important things that got me through it was my boys. And all the times that I was depressed, faults and all, my boys, Malcolm, Ernest, Nobby, you know, Mario, Ruben, Angel, Will, Chris, Ben, Robert, like my boys, I can name like eight, 10 guys, eight, 10 guys that were my crew, my crew. My dogs, like I, I remember my boys and we were in a small military town where I used to live, where I came from, right? So in a situation like that, you need to be around people who genuinely care about you, know your, you know, where you came from, know what you're going through, know how to support you properly, know what you do and don't need to hear at that time, have some emotional intelligence. And um, even if they don't, they were very invested in your well-being. And so you need the emotional support of being around people and you don't need to be in your head and you don't need to be places of judgment. You don't need to be dealing with a lot of like these internet strangers that don't have any empathy. Um, so I wouldn't be on social media to be frank. It's the last thing I would do because it's not mentally healthy to begin with, to be honest with you. So I wouldn't be doing social media. I wouldn't be saying they're trying to grow on YouTube if I was in this situation at all. I would need to rebuild my self-esteem from the ground up. And the way you're going to do that, especially if you're a, you know, a man of any age, if you're a man of any age, this specific advice is to you is that for men's mental health, you need to see transformation and change happen in your life and in the world that you do with your own two hands that you had control of and that you have ownership of. You need ownership over a physical real transformation of seeing something uh, be a thought, become a thing and happen in the real world. And I can specifically speak to the men's experience of this is that you, our mental health thrives when we do certain things. That's why for us sometimes working out is our therapy because we're able to take control of our body, take action and see a change in our body. We're able to see our weight go down when we get on the scale. We're able to see our muscles grow. We're able to see our facial structure change. We're able to see our gut change. We're able to see a transformation happen by the force of our own will. And then that gives us a sense of confidence that we have agency and we have the means to take control of our life and to change something and to manifest something in a tangible reality. And it's not in our head because our head was not our safe place. Since our head is not our safe place, we need to get out of it and we need to participate more in the world and we need to see some, something change in the world. That's why also doing in this situation, I would want to do something that's physically interactive with labor and interacting with people and maybe even something where I'm extremely helpful to people. So I'd either want to be working with my hands and seeing a transformation come from my labor every day, or I'd want to be working in something that forces me to consider the needs of others every day and work in some service job where I have to be thoughtful, considerate, think of others and not dwell on my own problems and think about how I can make their life better. And so then I'm making a positive uh, impact in people's lives. They're thanking me. I'm getting reinforced confidence, reinforced uh, sense of purpose, sense of value. If you are not someone who's religious or spiritual, I would try to give it a chance in that situation. I know that turns some people off, but I'm like, if you're in pain and you're desperate and it feels beyond you, give it a chance and seek a higher power and a higher purpose than yourself. And 
consider your smallness and have some humility there. If you haven't done that in the past, maybe that's a, something you need to look into. And I would also say that one of the other things is by prioritizing also looking at how you can raise your own value, how you can self-improve in every um, arena that you have access to. Say, you know, being as I am didn't serve me. So I will look to myself and say, I have more to offer. I have more that I can do in this world. And therefore, for me, one of the things that helped me a lot was um, working out, reading books and saying, we're going to become more intelligent. You know what I'm going to do? I'm finally going to improve my credit score. Let me work on my credit score and learn everything I can and master the credit algorithm. And so that gave me something to focus on and something to do and not be in my own mind. So I had an intellectual challenge and pursuit that would actually benefit my life and improve my finances. So then I mastered the credit algorithm. Um, I, I paid down debt and I prioritized that. And it really, really helped me because now I now had... Uh, confidence from, hey, I just changed my financial future significantly. And hey, I now don't have this monkey on my back from debt. So I'm also less stressed now. And hey, thinking and learning this thing made me feel smart. So now I improved my situation, my circumstances. So that was one thing I focused on. Okay. In my depression, I focused on things like my financial goals. I focused on for escapism. I didn't want to be in front of screens. I went and got some content. So I got really into reading. That's where I ended up reading most of my books in my library were in my darkest moments. So I got really into reading um, not only business books to make me smart, history books to give me a sense of perspective to say, hey, I can gain perspective by looking at the past and what people did and looking at the hard lives that people who came before me had. And then I can appreciate where I am in the modern world. And so reading about history, reading fantasy, reading those things gave me um, some perspective on that. Reading sci-fi gave me optimism and perspective of the future and that things can be accomplished, things can be built. Reading Asimov helped me realize that science fiction becomes science fact and that people dreamed of big, beautiful things that came to pass in the real world and people were inspired by them and they built things and I can be inspired and I can build things. So that helped me a lot for perspective. So I recommend reading, you know, reconnecting, finding your faith or rediscovering your faith, connecting to a higher power that can help you tremendously. And there's also fellowship that can happen in that. So looking to religion can be looking to a higher power that can be helpful to have some humility. Um, Looking at your physical fitness and transforming your body and dedicating yourself to perfecting that can balance out your emotions. You see the transformation that you have in the real world. Working with your hands lets you see a transformation happen in the real world. So I would do all of those things, and I wouldn't be, oh, I'm going to go all in on YouTube to start over. Nope, I, I don't believe in that, actually. I believe it's the last thing you should do because YouTube makes you subjective to criticism. It makes you subjective to the winds of an algorithm that doesn't care about you. It picks your, um, your accomplishments down to a numbers game instead of looking at incremental – uh, improvement. It causes comparison traps. It's not really great for mental health, if I'm being perfectly honest. So if you're in a vulnerable mental health state, the last thing you should do is social media, in my opinion, from my perspective. Um, I believe real life communities of care, being face to face with people every single day, not spending too much time alone. When you're spending time alone, getting your mind off of it by having purpose and working until it's time for you to go to sleep. Um, reading and escaping and putting yourself in this really good, calm place, listening to music with no lyrics, classical music, lo-fi music, jazz, really great for balancing out your mood and your mental health. So all of these things I think are better. I think it's better to go on a self-improvement journey and redefine yourself and improve every aspect of your well-being. Get your health and fitness at the highest level it's ever been. Get your finances in order. And that doesn't have to mean, oh, I go out and hustle and make more money. It could be I pay down debt. I improve my credit score. I improve um, aspects of my uh, credit rating. I become more financially literate and sound. I learn the beginnings of investing in stocks. I do something to improve my financial circumstances. Um, I go out and I spend more time with people who care about me. Um, I do more boys nights. I reconnect with family. I reconnect with estranged people in my life. I would do those things. I would do everything I can 
to keep my mind off of uh, the things that depress me. And I would pursue real accomplishments so I can see my life transform and change. I might even take up a sport or a hobby so I can see something that I have an accomplishment. I might try to pursue some tangible award, not something that's a popularity contest like YouTube, but an award that I can win by purely hard work alone if I qualify for it. So I would find qualifiers where I can just work hard and get awards so I can see tangible totems of my success and my improvement, and I'm not the same person that got themselves into this depressing place. So those are the things that I would do. And again, I know this was, I hope this is helpful, and I know this is a very personal, vulnerable time for you, but those are things I would do. I wouldn't be going all in on YouTube. I would put myself in the position from an earning and financial standpoint, I would go and I would find or try to pursue work that less lets me survive, but I would try to find meaningful work that I can throw my whole self into and just put everything I have into doing that hard work. And I don't think it needs to be something like YouTube is your dream. I think when I say go all in, I mean you should find something you could throw your back into, something that makes you too exhausted to think about being depressed, but also is then also building you up maybe physically or something that lets you serve others so that your self-esteem, confidence, and sense of value can come and say, see, people do value me. I do make contributions and I am respected and I am thoughtful and people are able to get something from the good person that I am and the smart person that I am. So like all of those things, I think add up to just a better circumstance. And then when you're in a healthy place and you're not so raw and you're not so vulnerable, you can ease your way back into social media because again, it's very difficult when it's online strangers, it's online criticism, it's judgments, it's ruthless algorithms that don't care about you. You need to be surrounded by people who genuinely have your best interests in heart, people who know when they need to give you a hug, a pat on the back, or even sometimes a stern talking to give you accountability, but give you emotional support. And, and I think that that's very important. I think that, um, I think that as from personal experience, this is what has worked for me, has worked for friends of mine, has worked for a lot of men of different ages that I know, and even some women. And I genuinely believe that this is the most helpful advice I could give you human to human that would benefit your life right now um, because it's in your best interest versus me telling you to go all in on YouTube would be the thing everyone would expect from me. And I do not believe that that's the answer for you in this point in your life. I believe the best thing for you to be in your life right now is present, grateful, humble, consistent, and to find a purpose and meaning and connection. I do not think that that's going to be provided um, from what the internet and social media has become today. Not for where you're at, not for the level of vulnerability of where you're at. So, yeah, uh, it looks like we had, um, you know, I was focusing on Sam there, but I think we had uh, definitely a good response from that in the uh, chat and in the comments. Um, and I appreciate you all. Um, I appreciate y'all and that, you know, hearing something like that, it does break my heart, but I think, um, it's important. It's why even, even in my book, one of the things I did differently that I saw in my book was, um, a friend of mine brought this up when I showed her the sample chapters of my book and she asked me a question and then she asked me one question and it made me go back and write four chapters in the book that specifically addressed the mental health of content creators. So when I wrote the book, this book was originally going to be 16 chapters. I spoke to my friends, Romina and Audrey. I talked to them. I ended up adding four chapters on mental health into this book. And it's because of all the books on being a creator for a career and doing the creator economy, I did not find that most people address the realities, the burden, the mental health. They certainly didn't, if they did, they didn't dedicate a whole chapter to it. And I thought it was too important. And then I went beyond a chapter and I said, there are four things I really want to focus on with that. So let me give them their due and give them dedicated chapters. Um, if I had to do it over, there might have been five chapters on mental health and I might have expanded the whole book to 25 chapters because I might have done another chapter on basically each of my four core or and or five core. Yeah, it's five core. So I probably would have ended up making 25 chapters um, if I was doing it over. Chad Mullen says, question, Roberto. I'm building a foundation around my channel. How much of that would be suitable to build before requesting an overview of the channel with you? Uh, it depends, Chad. If you're building a business, 
then even from the beginning, I can give you value. But if you're not building a business, I would at least say it'd be better for you to be monetized before you spend a dollar with me or anyone else. But if there's a real business intent behind this and there's a business model or you already have a business, then we can start right away. But if not, I would definitely say maybe be monetized, at least be monetized. Uh, that way, the advice has a chance of breaking even, going profitable and being viable financially. Um, you know, so so I would say that. Yeah, if you don't have a person, purpose, everything becomes your problem. You don't have a way to filter important information that helps you achieve your goals. I'd agree with that. And yeah, being IRL, probably one of the most important things. Absolutely. More crazy wild find says, how can you uh, use affiliate links such as Amazon affiliate links in YouTube shorts? I'm getting a lot of views on my reviews and I want to start following, uh, start showing brands my data make revenue okay so what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to use this thing called genius link and then you're going to use genius link um and what i can do is i'll get you guys a link to genius link and <laughs> um it'll be an affiliate link for genius link ha 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 um so that let me find that real quick Because I know I, I know I have a um, an affiliate link for Genius Link somewhere, but the thing I would say about this is that, uh, excuse me, if you ultimately want to do Q, um, do links from YouTube Shorts, the way you're going to do it, at least from my perspective, the way you're going to do it is you're going to use QR codes. Now, at some point, YouTube might, um, how should I put this? At some point, YouTube might do something about QR codes or may decide that it's a workaround that they don't like. However, however, I do personally think, and this is just me, I do think it, if you're doing YouTube shorts and you want to benefit from it in terms of affiliate links for the reason that you stayed and for also wanting to prove yourself to brands later, I feel that the way that you would do that is with using um, QR codes. And the way you would generate QR codes probably easily, probably use Genius Link to accomplish that. And let's see. I could have swore I had an affiliate link for Genius Link, but if not, I'll just post, um, you know, the regular uh, thing to sign up for it. I don't mind doing that. So Genius Link is a tool that I use. Genius Link. And, you know, just tell them on Twitter that Roberto sent you or something. But <clears throat> with, with Genius Link, you can generate QR codes and you can also, oh, here's the referral program link. I know I wasn't losing my mind. All right, so actually, sign up for Genius Link using this. Sign up for Genius Link. All right, so just use this link that I'm posting here now so in the chat, and I'll, I'll try to link to this in the description of the video. I'll try to remember. But the point is... Um, with Genius Link, you can do redirect short links, but you also can generate QR codes for this and you can control where the QR code goes to. The goal is if you do YouTube Shorts, you post a visual edit into the short where the QR code is and they can snap a picture of that and use that to then use your link to go to the affiliate program to get the thing that you talked about. Um, you might need to do a verbal call out in the videos of the QR code when you put it on screen and you might want to point to where it's going to be in the edit. However, this will not retroactively be something you can add to your YouTube shorts after the fact. So you can't benefit from old YouTube shorts because of this. So YouTube killing the links to YouTube shorts 
really screwed people over. Another way you can get around uh, Amazon affiliate links with YouTube Shorts is redirect them to a video that you've made, whether it's public or unlisted, that is a video, that is a rundown, that also in the description has all of your Amazon affiliate links for things. And you can then link to that from the YouTube Shorts through the related videos link, which takes them to a video that is now more optimized for converting affiliate conditions. Like it could be a mega review of oh, all the things. And then you link to a bunch of things in the description and then that could drive affiliate sales. So um, just kind of keep in mind that that could be an option for uh, how you start driving um, affiliate from Amazon using the YouTube shorts because of all the views you get. So those would be my two best options. Um, either using the QR code or using a mega video that's long form and links in the description and in the info card and the video and yada, 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 and using that. Yeah. Um, Ty's Hot Mess History says, my videos are a style of faceless history. After I started making hour-long videos, I started getting 3,000, 10,000 subs per month after a slump of only getting 1,000 per month. Yeah, so this actually kind of proves the point of what I was talking about earlier. And again, um, Ty is a faceless content creator that I've actually worked with. Um, yeah, you know, so there you go. 100,000 subscribers, 3,000, 10,000 a month, boom making longer videos can have that impact by the way because longer watch history then promotes and pushes up in youtube more relevant so those things can actually really help also when people watch something for a long time they are more likely to want to subscribe to that creator so i find that those things uh could definitely help in at least tactically Any tips for a creator who uses a lot of B-roll and video editing, uh, but because of this? Um, I'm not really sure of this question, so I don't really know how to answer that. Um, Katie Ukulele, there may be a point that I do an entire book on creator mental health, but I want to co-author it with supplements from mental health professionals that also are prominent in social media that can speak to it. So the thing is, um, what I'll do is I'll probably need to curate a couple of supplements from mental health um, professionals and advocates that um, I could personally vet, anecdotes from creators who've publicly um, experienced mental health issues and challenges. And so I could write from my own perspective and I could write what I think would be good overall advice that at least acknowledges the issues that creators deal with in that. But if I did, I'd want to supplement it with the advice of professionals and other people's experiences that exist outside of my personal range of experience. Um, so I'd want to be careful with that. I think it could be helpful and people feel less alone. I'm more trepidatious about that. So that might be much, 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 much later in my career. But I might make something that could be a prototype of it that I might put behind a paywall that's not super, super public consumption that um, to be judged that's only for my people. So um, that might be something I do um, just so that's not fully, fully out there. And so no one can accuse me of being irresponsible. Um, but yeah, <clears throat> the other thing that I would probably want to focus on first that is kind of a lead into that is I'd probably do a shorter uh, book, but concentrate book on the creator mindset and address mental health in the creator mindset um, and put a lot of it in uh, the, you know, to test it out, to put a lot of that in there. And then at some point, much, much later in my career, a lot of it would be anecdotal. So people can't criticize me too much if the mental health frame is mostly my own experience. But then if I supplement that with people who go through different things other than me, and there's advice from a curated panel of mental health professionals that are prominent in social media, where they put their two cents in or their perspective or some actionable advocacy advice, then that makes sense. Yeah, Ty's Hot Mess History says, um, 
I backed away from uh, YouTube when I was going through depression, right when I hit 100,000 subs and didn't even care because I was down. Yep, no, that happens. That absolutely happens. Yes, W chat. Appreciate all of you in the chat. Yeah, a um, book about the um, creator mindset sounds great. Maybe there's a pattern for the mental health of careers. Uh, there's some underlying pathology and patterns for um, creators struggling with mental health. Yeah, absolutely. Um, one of the reasons creator mental health isn't discussed is as much is because one, it's super sensitive, then it's super broad, super public, and then there's a lot of people that the criticism of it comes from a place of hurt or not being stable. So it's very delicate. Um, there's a lot of downside to be had uh, for the upside. So it's tricky, very tricky. Kevin Sullivan says, any tips for a creator that's complicated video editing? So because of this can only put out one video a week, can they put out more videos even though the audience got used to the complicated? Um, I wouldn't because then I would say that you go to the more extreme version of the upload cadence. And then if you're going to go complicated, then I would just go harder on the videos, but package them better. Uh, so I'd go harder, but I'd package better because if I did, then you could go to the extreme on the subscribers or even um, the slightly less extreme version. And it might be worth it, especially if you want to get to 100,000 subscribers. If you can only do one video a week, make it the best video ever then. Um, because it doesn't seem like it's because you, you know, you the job or this or that, but it seems like part of the issue for you is that the complicate it's the complicated nature of the video. So then I would say that you're being a little less aggressive than James Johnny, who posts like once a month or once every other couple months. If you're gonna go once a week, um, I think that it's worth it to make the video in such a way to where you know that that video is going to get more than a couple hundred um, subscribers per month off the viewing of that video. So I would go more extreme and I would, um, but I would do it around a subject matter that will draw in the most amount of people optimize or hire out for the thumbnail to get the most amount of views if I'm going to do that. So the thing is, if I'm going to do that complicated editing, I'm going to hire someone to do an even better thumbnail than the edit. And then I'm going to work the hell out of that title. I'm only going to pick a subject matter, not because I'm interested or passionate about it. I'm only picking a subject matter that millions of people give a damn about. If I'm doing all of that work and I can only get out one video, it has to be a video that everybody will care about and that I can get the most views out of, and therefore I can translate that to the most subscribers, So, and that that thing can keep getting me new subscribers a month if I'm gonna do all of that. If I'm gonna spend 40 hours of my week editing just one bloody video, then somebody else is spending a week doing three or five variations of that thumbnail round the clock, dealing with me in revision hell as a client, and then I'm getting the most views I can out of that video, and then 1% or 1.5% of those become subscribers. So then my target view floor for that video is 50 to 100,000 um, views out the gate with the possibility of getting another um, 10 to 30,000 views on a video every month that that video exists. So that that video that I'm putting out, if I'm working 40 hours a week, or if I spend 100 hours and only put out two videos a month, if I put out, if I spend... 100 hours editing a video. Someone's making six thumbnails for that and they're working around the clock and they're gonna be one of the best damn thumbnail artists ever and I'm gonna like pay whatever I have to pay for that and then that's how that would be if I was doing that kind of content and doing a documentary style thing, 100 hours to do the video edit. Somebody's working around the clock. Somebody's gonna be slaving over variations of those thumbnails. I'm getting five, six thumbnail variations and they're gonna be the best damn thumbnails ever. Then if I'm working around the clock doing that, I'm only releasing one to two videos a month doing that. but I am making those videos so that the guaranteed view floor in 30 days is 50 to a quarter million view views in um, 30 days. Maybe I can even live with 90 days to get that. But then that they get tens of thousands of more views every single month so that by the end of a year, if I only make these 
12 to 24 videos in a year, then all of them have a quarter million to a million views over the course of a year. The reason I need that out of spending 100 hours per video is I need every one of those videos to translate to thousands of subscribers and keep churning as evergreen content thousands of subscribers because then I'm on the same path as like James Johnny or Magnates Media or Dodford or Patty Galloway. And I know that I have a pathway absolutely within a couple of years to a silver play button, if not a gold play button in exchange for that effort. So if you aspire to make complicated videos, go big or go home. That's how I would do it. But if I'm going to edit like that, I also know, do I really have the talent to be the best thumbnail artist in the world? No, I'd outsource it. And I'd have someone working around the clock and give me four to six thumbnail variations of the best thumbnails ever for me to package and repackage those videos. Uh, fixed point says is selling a paid course better than a paid monthly membership. Actually, what you want to do is both. I actually covered this in a workshop Wednesday before. And what you really want to do is do both. I also made a video about this and how to earn $5,000 a month from memberships. You want to do both. You actually want to do both. Different subject, but I think it would be along the lines of how you'd possibly want to address mental health with content creators. Um, hmm. Question, Roberto, is Facebook ads since still beneficial as a revenue source? Is it worth building a platform there? Uh, from a repurposing standpoint, yes. Uh, so live streaming to Facebook like I'm doing right now while doing it on YouTube, Twitch, X.com, formerly Twitter, Kick.com, so on and so forth. Um, LinkedIn Live, yes, repurposing content that you use with like Opus Clip and AI to curate and cut clips and then post a bunch of those to Facebook and let the views roll in, yes, because it's not extra work if you do it that way, but natively making videos for Facebook, nah, not really, but if you can just use the repurposing models that I use, yes, if you can repurpose and put podcast episodes and podcast clips over there, yes, so yeah, from that standpoint, yeah. Alex Hernandez says, hey, Roberto, I made a video that's doing well, but it's very controversial and almost all the engagement against my video's point of view. Is it worth it to keep up or delete? It's close to 70K views. Um, I'm going to go with no such thing as bad press. Leave it up. Move on to the next video. Um, if you don't like the response and how it feels, just don't revisit this again. Uh, but just let people have their say and just let it ride and uh, ignore it. Turn off notifications for the comments on your videos so you don't see notifications anymore if it's bothering you. But mm, I wouldn't bother deleting or unlisted if it's got 70K views at this point. Unless you feel it's doing some material harm in the real world, then that'd be different, obviously, from an ethics standpoint. But other than that, it's just people having opinions. The internet's full of them. So, yeah, I, I, I don't think there's anything to worry about there. Yeah, but I think that's it. And I just want to make sure that I did get all the super chats. I'm almost positive I got all the super chats. Super sticker. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep, I did get all of your super chats. Thank you very much for all of those. Um, and let's see. Okay, so we definitely talked about membership. We talked about digital products and the margins. We talked about ad revenue. We uh, talked about sponsorships, and we did definitely cover that. I feel like the biggest thing we didn't really talk about, and I guess I can do a few more minutes, and then we can all wrap up. We can all go to bed or go to dinner. I think the last thing I can talk about is affiliate marketing. Currently, I think I do about 6000 to 6500 a month 
through uh, software as a service-based affiliate marketing. I used to do about 1500 a month in Amazon affiliate marketing. You guys know I'm a big tech guy. So it was like, you know, hardware, gadgets, and stuff like that. Um, I used to get, uh, you know, um, on my tech reviews, a lot of people don't realize, in the early days of my YouTube career, I did Tech Tuesdays. And it was on either tutorials for software stuff, or it was hardware stuff, camera gear, tech, desktop tech, cameras, laptops, desktop components, you name it. And back in the day when I did this, back in my day, back in the day when I did this, I was getting like 20,000, 100,000, quarter million views on some of these videos. In fact, when I showed you my ad revenue, I don't know if some of you noticed that uh, there was a lot of uh, tech content in there that did significantly well for me. I mean, there were um, laptop reviews. They didn't like the CPM was like, okay on that, but like, but the views did well. I mean, look at some of the views on some of those tech videos. I had laptop videos and some of these things had like hundreds of thousands of views. Um, the affiliate revenue on those was better than the ad revenue. I had laptop reviews. Look at this laptop review. You know, um, you know 300,000 views. Uh, Premiere tutorial for uh, ah, <laughs> Adobe Premiere uh, Pro tutorial. 300,000 uh, views on that. InDesign tutorial, almost half a million views. Um, this uh, almost 700,000 views on Microsoft Surface Studio review. So like I wasn't unknown to the tech space and I was significantly successful talking about things that are not YouTube related. Um, because again, I didn't do that to like after, um, not significantly until I had like after 100,000 subscribers. Um, GPU versus CPU, uh, almost a quarter million views on that. Uh, best specs for uh, graphic design uh, desktops, uh, 200,000 views. So uh, like gadgets and tech, I did a lot. I did very well on views and that converted very well to affiliate links, which did very well for me in the Amazon uh, influencer program back when it was called the Amazon Associates program. So like I, I did really well with this. I'd get like, you know, hundreds of thousands of views on my tech content and on my tutorial content and on my camera lens reviews. Um, it was significant. How much RAM do you need for video editing? 150,000 views. Uh, Filmora, Wondershare, 150,000. So like I, I, I did well on things completely unrelated to growing um, a YouTube channel and uh, growth strategy as a content creator for many, many years in YouTube. And the significant part of revenue that came from that was I started working with brands and getting brand deals in the tech space, but I also did really well in affiliate revenue, both with manufacturing, the manufacturers having affiliate programs, but also Amazon's affiliate program at the time was very different. It was much more profitable back then. So it was really good back then. Um, you know, and volume would uh, in sales would get you better commissions in Amazon um, for sure back then. So it was a fairly significant revenue stream. And back uh, in my day, back in my day, back in the day, what would happen is, for me at least, because I lived in North Carolina, where like rent on a three bedroom house was like 960 a month. Making $1,500 a month on Amazon was renting utilities for the most part. So it was a good deal. Um, and, and I wasn't even a huge creator at the time. So it worked out really well. I think a lot of you underestimate how life-changing affiliate revenue can be. Um, and if you want to do legit affiliate uh, revenue, mostly you could do the Amazon affiliate program. And then after that, it's software companies like Adobe and other software companies. And so for me, I started doing software companies. Uh, the biggest one you guys probably know about is TubeBuddy, and that did like three grand a month for me uh, with Kajabi, another 1500 a month. Um, I think 400 for the epidemic sound. And so I do enough of these affiliate programs and it all adds up. And so I do about six grand on affiliate um, or more a month because like between Kajabi and TubeBuddy, that's like five grand in affiliate or more depending on the month. And then after that, I make up the other 1500 or more with other affiliate programs, um, you know, with cheaper products and stuff like that, or just less well known. And so it all adds up. It all adds up a little, 150 over here, 200 over here, 600 over here. It all adds up. And so that can be significant income and revenue from you guys. 
Um, in my peak, I did have some $10,000 affiliate uh, marketing months in my peak, but I need more evergreen edited tutorial style content to generate those links. And if I was going to do it more in the tech space, it'd be more uh, obviously product review stuff that's specific to a group of people like video editors or photographers or um, filmmakers or videographers and so on and so forth. Because even when those things only get 10, 20,000 views, but you saw that mine could get tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of views. It's targeted views that are for product people who are looking to buy things and buy hardware and buy gear. So they load up, they buy a bunch of stuff, add to their cart, boom, boom, boom. And so it's really good money um, in that niche because if you get even 10,000 people to watch um, a tech product review, there is a very significant chance to have 10,000 viewers. There are 200 buyers that click on your link and buy something. And so that's how it ends up being. You, that's how you, with that, you get like, oh, wow, now I've got this, like, you know, even though I got a small percentage of a commission, oh my God, it's, I did so much volume that now, oh, wow, this is hundreds of dollars in a week and so on and so forth. And, uh, and then, oh, hundreds of dollars in a week becomes thousands of dollars in a month. And, and then the, the manufacturers have better affiliate programs often than Amazon. Um, the Amazon and YouTube do these low ball commissions on the affiliate comparatively. I'd say YouTube's affiliate program does a better percentage with the manufacturers, but Amazon gets more clicks typically than the tag products in YouTube. So it's iffy. But direct manufacturer links, while not always having the best overall click amount, they convert at higher percentage because the manufacturers might give you like 10 or 15%, where Amazon might give you 2 to 5%, or YouTube might give you 5%, maybe 8 or 10 on a specific um, program. So the manufacturer is doing 10, 15, 20. It's better. And they might give you a discount code for your audience, so then more people click on it. So... Uh, direct manufacturer affiliate links, very good in product spaces for tech, beauty, and lifestyle. Tech, beauty, and lifestyle, affiliate marketing, gangbusters, really great. Um, so with affiliate marketing, it's usually the variety of affiliate programs you have. Software as a service gets you monthly affiliate programs, but don't skip on bounties either in terms of one-time payments if you can do them in bulk. So... And if you can make evergreen content that's constantly churned for people looking to buy, then that's that's valuable there. So that'd be how you could get to a place to where you could get to 10,000 in affiliate marketing specifically. Um, so yeah. Um, and, and again, sometimes it's hard to be consistent, but the more evergreen content you make that is geared toward the Amazon affiliate uh, program that's uh, targeting buyers, um, it could be very powerful. And then there's also with the Amazon Influencer Program, they have direct video uploads to where you could be the video product review for the thing. And if people watch that native on Amazon, then you can uh, get more affiliate commissions there. So even with Amazon, even without your YouTube channel hitting big for it, you can make money directly in Amazon with their Influencer Program. So um, that, that can be powerful. I think a big reason a lot of people don't convert on affiliate is one, they don't do verbal call outs for the affiliate programs in their videos, number one. Two, they don't demonstrate the value of the thing that they're um, selling. So like the reason camera and laptop stuff would work for me, I would do product feature showcases, right? Um, so I wouldn't just do reviews and I would do trilogies. If I had a product, I made three videos about the product. So I became an authoritative source on that product because I had three videos about the product that were very, very good, and I attacked major angles. So one, I do a product showcase because I don't do paid reviews. So a product showcase is me showing off the top five features of the product. Then I do a use case video that's like, okay, best laptop for editors, best laptop for graphic designers, best for this, best in show, best for this feature, right? So then it's an in-depth video in one dimension of the use case of the product. Then when I'm no longer under contract with the company and 30 days have passed and the contract's expired from them sending me a product, if I did that instead of buying the product myself, 30-day review of the product. And then so 30-day reviews, people like. So I'd always do a trilogy for my product reviews a lot of the time. And so a trilogy would um, definitely get me more um, affiliate commissions a lot of the time because now there were more touch points for my credibility with the product. I could link videos to each other for people who are buyers. So then uh, when I can't do a trilogy on something, I would make a buyer's guide for the product category. So my laptop buyer's guide videos did excellent on YouTube, actually. And if I... 
sort by views, I, I probably have like a lot of views on those, or if I did a search for it, but like I did laptop, actually this is laptop buying advice. This wasn't even a full on buyer's guide. This one did 300,000 views. Some of my buyer's guides probably did a hundred thousand or, or more views. Um, but yeah, I, I would do these buyer's guides for something like that. And it would do extremely um, well for me. Now that filter is not working. So like, yeah, so I would do things like, um, uh, that filter is not working. Oh, wait, I could use a group filter and I could probably look for, do I have tech videos? Um, videos about money, videos about content, speaking engagements, tech videos. It's probably is not an up-to-date group of videos, but it, it should prove the point well enough. Um, I love the grouping feature in YouTube. So let's see, uh, where are views? Views, views, views. Ah, views. Here we go. Okay, yeah. So, like, I, I would do these videos, um, you know, and I'd, I'd get decent views on a lot of these videos. And a lot of this would convert later into product sales. So, I, I did all right when it came to tech content, you know. A lot of these videos did very well. And I was a smaller creator than I am now. So, the views are much more impressive than they might seem given how much smaller of a creator I was at the time. So um, I think I did all right for myself when it came to tech YouTube. And so this is where a lot of people underestimate um, underestimate my capacity, let's say, to um, make other content. And the result was that these would also convert in gangbuster numbers for product sales for the affiliate links. Um, and then by having multiple products in a video, that would do very really well too. So that's why sometimes um, buyer's guides that then have um, 10, 15, 20 products and why to uh, pick them and what they're good at um, would uh, be very helpful to people and people really enjoyed those videos. And they would also um, convert, not in ad revenue. You can see the ad revenue was not great for me on those. Um, even from subscribers from that, you know, it's not as robust, but did the, the uh, but the views were there, the views were there and the affiliate money was certainly there. Um, at the time, I feel like, um, <clears throat> excuse me, obviously videos, and this is not going to be all of them, but uh, make money content obviously did well. And that um, certainly helped and. I would say there was less affiliate marketing there, but there was some and getting the numbers up on book sales back in the day used to also help with um, the affiliate side with Amazon back when they used to do volume. So as you can see, I actually got about 70,000 of my subscribers just from make money online content. So not even YouTube this, YouTube that, more related to making money, freelancing, affiliate marketing, uh, you know, um, careers, um, you know, passive income, things like that. Um, you can see that um, the revenue on this was really good relative to the views. So relative to the views, the money was really good. 5 million views, 50, 50 grand, and the subscriber numbers, 5 million views, uh, translates to um, almost 70,000 subscribers. So much higher converting rate for those videos. Um Graphic design-based videos. Um, the grouping feature used to only let me group 100 videos, so it's not fully accurate. There's more videos, but it used to limit me. Um, so back then, for graphic design stuff, um, I also got uh, about 60,000 subscribers on that. The conversion rate there is about 1%, what we'd expect. The revenue, not as great, but it is what it is. Um, but I also got hella views on graphic design content and dominated for graphic design content. So um, even for my top 50 videos out of 100 on this, um, did 
like the view floor was 30,000. I was a smaller creator back then in terms of lifetime view floor uh, with a view ceiling of half a million there. So, and as you can see, um, I did good in views on this over time. So I did all right for myself. I did all right for myself. So in the graphic design category, that got me a bunch of my subscribers. So as you can see, I, I really would, and, and I'm not making this up, obviously, from the data. Even without YouTube help content, I still would have been successful in YouTube and was successful in YouTube to some degree. And I did all right for myself. And affiliate marketing was my big YouTube stream. It was not AdSense. Affiliate marketing did better for me than AdSense by a lot. And so on the camera gear side, I actually did really good with camera and video editing tutorial stuff. The subscribers like was smaller in comparison to the views. The, so the ratio of conversion there wasn't as good. Um, neither was the revenue. Um, but I did okay for myself there. Um, but I did better on the views. The It was the conversion rate for those views sometimes. But I did okay on the views. Some obviously better than others, but you know where this really shined? It was the affiliate links that really killed it for this category. The affiliate money was so good for this category at the time relative to what I was earning on AdSense. AdSense was a joke back then compared to this, and I was in an MCN deal at the time. So at the time, I was getting half of my AdSense money taken from me anyway. So, you know, boo, you know, it's like, doesn't matter. So... Doesn't even matter. Uh, but yeah, uh, so I did all right on that, you know, in terms of that category. Um, I did some vlogging back in the day. That probably didn't really do much for helping me with subscribers. I mean, maybe a little bit. Yep, almost no views in that. Um, there were some outliers with that. Uh, not a ton of subscribership coming from that. So again... But my life isn't really that interesting enough to vlog, <laughs> to be honest with you. Um, not relative to what people care about anyway. Um, let's see. Social media and small business content. That did all right for me in terms of the view to subscriber uh, conversion rate was decent for what it was. Some outlier videos performed really well there. Certain ones were too granular, too specific at the time to get any views. Um, so it is what it is. So those were a lot of the majority of my underperforming videos um, were social media related. And they also interviews at the time I did with social media influencers. So those drastically underperformed. Didn't make a lot of money on those, um, relatively speaking. I think not bad for the amount of views, though. The money was not bad for the amount of views. I would even say for the amount of views, the subscribers weren't bad, if I'm being honest. But um, really rough um, to do that. But also, the amount of content in that category that I did was not significant. It was only uh, 50 videos compared to categories where I did 100 videos, and I've made 1,600 videos. So, you know, it is what it is. Um, but, yeah, that just gives you a concept of why I believe that there are revenue streams that are much, much more significant than ad revenue. I went over the ad revenue stuff with you, but I genuinely believe that there is a better path to monetization by far by diversifying your income, diversifying your platforms, and finding better monetization systems than relying on the ones that the platforms provide via direct product sales of your own, digital and physical products, digital and physical products, services like I did with a coaching business where you can do other services, memberships, very significant sponsored brand deals are usually the path for most content creators and of course affiliate marketing. So I believe that those things can be very powerful and I think it's not that, oh, I don't care about platform revenue at all. It's that um, just really look at what you can do beyond what the platforms offer and I think it will be better. Um, hella, hella bass, uh, hella base, uh, says I've got an email from what looks like YouTube. Is this legit last chance you're eligible for a YouTube partner manager? No, that's a scam. That's a hundred percent a scam. Uh, YouTube never sends emails like that.
More Crazy Wild Fine says, what's the best uh, call to action to have in a YouTube short to drive affiliate conversions from a QR code, in your opinion? Um, it would really, really depend on what it is. Uh, there's no blanket statement for that. It's just whatever. Uh, it, it depends entirely on that. Yeah, do not click anything that so-called comes from youtube official about things like giving you a channel manager or whatever like no nah, it's gonna just hack your channel that's n like nope don't even look at it they do not title their stuff that way they're very professional Um, Alex Hernandez says for a 3k sub channel, what would be the norm for channel views? It depends on the niche entirely. Views are not decided by your subscriber count, like at all. I showed you guys this before 80% of all the views in the lifetime of my channel never came from subscribers. It never came from subscribers. Subscribers have nothing to do with how many views you get on YouTube. You get subscribers because people watch your videos. You do not get people to watch your videos because they subscribe. It sounds hella backwards, but I'm, I promise you. So there is no there's no normal because you now are not accounting for the niche, the total addressable market, the seasonal conditions that affect that market. There are too many variables to say, oh, a channel with this many subscribers should get this many views. The YouTubers who say that, they're full of crap. They don't mean to be full of crap, but they are because they're just basing it partly off of some very ego driven, egocentric idea that subscribers entitle people to views when what decides views is topic, title, thumbnail and timing. And timing also is trend. So it's seasonality, too, or it's trend or it's seasonality or it's the time commitment or the availability of the viewer. So. There, there are too many variables for you to arbitrarily decide that YouTuber subscribers should determine the number of views that they can get. It's a very, it's a thing that young YouTubers love to obsess about, and that's partly because young YouTubers grew up watching big YouTubers, and they almost all exclusively watch big YouTubers. They don't watch small YouTubers, and they decide the culture, and then they grow up, and then they still have the frame of mind of the YouTube they grew up with, and that's changed so dramatically over the years. So the algorithm doesn't care how many subscribers you have. The algorithm has no care for how many subscribers you have, so it makes no determination of that, of how many views you should get. And people think that only people who don't have a good view to sub ratio believe that. No, it's, it's, you know what's the empirical evidence we have for it and why everyone should stop giving a crap about view to subscriber ratio? The existence of YouTube shorts debunks view to subscriber ratio. The very existence of YouTube shorts and the reach of YouTube shorts debunks anything that anyone believes about view to subscriber ratio and that certain subscriber counts entitle you to expect certain views or that there's a normalization of those views. The very existence and the way YouTube shorts works annihilates that idea. And so I, I wanna make that abundantly clear. Like the minute that you realize how YouTube shorts is, you go view to subscriber base shows are BS. No one should believe in them. No one should talk about view to subscribe ratios because YouTube shorts makes nonsense out of it. It's like, oh, that there goes that idea. <laughs> so the very existence of YouTube shorts actually eliminates this concept and holdover from how YouTube used to work when subscriber counts actually mattered. YouTube subscribers used to matter once upon a time algorithmically. They no longer matter algorithmically. The good news for that is that for a small YouTuber, as long as you hit a topic, there's always a chance. As long as you, excuse me, as long as your topic, title, thumbnail, and you get to take advantage of timing, there's always a chance for a small YouTuber. Always a chance for a small YouTuber. That's the good news, which means it's not just about the big dogs. You got as much of a chance. If there's a new video game that comes out, there's a new skin that drops. I have content creators that are in gaming. Gaming is one of those really hard to competing niches. I have um, 40 creators a year I coach uh, with uh, Supercell, um, which owns Clash of Clans, ba uh, Clash Royale, and Brawl Stars, and a bunch of other games. It owns like a bunch of the top 20 games in mobile gaming, right? Uh, millions of users worldwide. I coach uh, 40 creators a year for Supercell, okay? And 
one of the things that we know with them is that they can have an overperforming outlier video that gets 10x what their subscriber count is because a new skin dropped and they covered it on day one, or they got early access because they're a tier three creator in the Supercell Creator Program. They got early access to know, and then the day one, the minute the embargo's over, they have a video about the new skin drop, new character, new this, new um, n- you know, new feature, and then huh, gangbuster views. Why? Timing, timing of the market. Timing of the market. It's like getting early to a stock, right? It's like, oh, I know and NVIDIA is going to split. Oh, get in early on the market and boom, to the moon, right? To the moon. So the thing is timing the market and having a secret market advantage of, I can jump this right away, breaking news, da-da-da-da-da. Breaking news, being able to jump on that, doesn't matter what your subscriber count is. Doesn't matter. Boom. So all of a sudden, there's a demand in the market. You're early to the market and you're supplying it. You win. That's that's a real thing. So timing is the thing that most creators break out on. Most creators break on timing. I did this with a Microsoft Surface Studio review because I was at Adobe Max, and the only other person who had a hands-on review for a, a Microsoft Surface Studio was CNET.com and iGestein. Everyone else's stuff was bogged down in shipping, but I was at a physical event, had physical access to the product, 600,000 views. 600,000 views before I ever had 600,000 subscribers. So I had many, many times more views than I did subscribers on a video in the thing that I'm not even as known for because I was early to the market and I was one of the only three people in the market who had access to a product. Timing is that significant in the outcome of a YouTube channel. Matters more than subs, matters more than anything else in most cases is timing. Timing and having early privileged access, embargo dates, secret access, secret sauce, those things actually matter a lot more than people would ever imagine they do. And it can be the big deciding difference. So that's something most people will not tell you. And it can change the entire trajectory of your channel if you get to take advantage of it multiple, multiple times in a row or within a period of time. So that can that can definitely change um, things so much, so much. Time and what people are interested in. Absolutely. Absolutely. People who get to do um, spoilers, people who get to do um, leaks, for example, like my friend John Prosser, my friend John Prosser, front page tech, someone I mentored. Okay. He gets massive views whenever he's able to leak stuff before the Apple event happens. And then people check back and watch his videos because they want to do the accuracy of his leaks. So you see? But not everyone can be John Prosser and build an informant network, <laughs> you know? But that's that's a powerful skill set, though. That's a powerful skill set. So having industry access, insider access, scoops, information, and informant network, that can be powerful in your niche if you're um, someone like a product reviewer or a TV or movie show reviewer. If you get access to insider info that no one else has, you can always be ahead of the market and win. Uh, Ring Ringo TV reaction says, I've been telling people for years that sub counts don't matter. It's about your topics and interest of the people. It's all about what viewers want to see. Yes, we call this TAM. We call this total addressable market. So the thing is, when you understand that, and then you have a um, an early mover advantage or a first mover advantage, and you can capitalize on those things, it's incredibly powerful. So finding ways to have early or first mover advantage in the niche that you're in, when people really care about something is incredibly powerful uh, for you to be able to do. Yeah, um, Pop Story says, yeah, that makes a lot of sense, Roberto. uh, Sub to view ratio doesn't matter anymore, especially when you consider shorts. Yup, yup, that makes a difference. Um, more crazy while fine says does YouTube tags matter when you're a small channel titles matter the most for YouTube. I would tell you to not go crazy worrying about tags. I don't believe that they don't matter. YouTube says they matter less than they ever did. I'm, I'm fine with them saying that I have evidence that can help with Google search and other things. Um, possibly when you're monetized, it can help to some degree, but what I will say about tags is more of you should be worried about topic title, thumbnail timing and transcript. And the last thing, the very, very last thing, most of you, regardless of size, should worry about is tags. 
Tags and keywords are not the same thing, though. So keywords matter a lot, in my opinion, but not as good as emotionally triggering titles. Emotionally leveraged titles, titles that show emotional intelligence, emotional and intellectual curiosity, that can be more, that's about copywriting and title and headline writing. So writing compelling titles is extremely important. Keywords in your titles and transcripts are important. The choice of keywords in a thumbnail, if you use it, and it not being the same keywords, but now an emotionally compelling keyword can also be important as a qualifier. And so topic, title, thumbnail, timing, and transcripts matter more, and tags matter the least out of those things in that equation, but I'm not going to say they matter zero. But I would tell you topic, title, uh, time, topic, title, thumbnail, and timing, not necessarily in that order, it's just easier to say, and transcript would all matter significantly more, significantly more. And I can qualify those. So that that that's why it's important. Um, so again, I'm not saying ignore tags. I'm saying y'all worry too much about it. And from your perspective, and even from big YouTubers' perspective, the reason so many big YouTubers say tags don't matter, tags don't matter, SEO doesn't matter, is because it doesn't apply to their content. Tags matter much more in theory if you're a product reviewer. One of the reasons I was a big on tags is you have to remember, What was my content? Tutorial content and product review content, product showcases and videos that were about step-by-step processes. Those are things where tags would matter much more. So if you're a tech reviewer, camera reviewer, beauty reviewer, maybe a TV show reviewer, for us in those categories, we probably would not say tags don't matter because they matter for us in YouTube. They matter for us in Amazon. They matter for us in Google. So in those niches specifically, but what percentage of YouTube do you think that is? That's not the majority of YouTube. The majority of YouTuber are entertainers. It's gamers. It's prank channels. It's spectacle content. It's storytelling content. It's lifestyle content. It's vloggers. It's, um, the, the travel it's these th- so the thing is it's not things that would benefit even tangentially from tags to the same degree that a product review you see what i'm saying so the thing is when people say oh this doesn't matter that doesn't matter they're talking about the youtube that they use and the youtube they experience and youtube from their perspective and the thing is if they're in the most popular verticals in youtube i understand why they're saying that But that doesn't mean there aren't categories of YouTube where something is more important than it is others. So you see, for example, in product review niches, photography is more important than graphic design for thumbnails. If you review products, photography is more important than graphic design. But if you do spectacle and storytelling, then digital art design, maybe even AI tools become more important to the storytelling of a thumbnail. Obviously, photography still has to be the base. But digital art and photo manipulation becomes more important. So then what's your thesis of thumbnails? The thesis of thumbnails to some degree will be the same, but then it'll specialize depending on what you do. So for someone who's a product reviewer, beautiful product photography, staging, posing, all those things, framing, those dimensions might be more important for them to get click-through rates. If you're a tech reviewer, cinematic content might matter more than if you're a vlogger, depending on the vlogging. If you're doing travel, cinematic content might matter more. If you're doing a prank channel, cinematic content doesn't matter. If you're doing IRL streaming, cinematic content doesn't matter. But does that mean cinematic content doesn't matter to YouTube? No, it means it doesn't matter to your content because you're doing pranks. Script writing might not matter if you're a prank channel. But if you're a documentary channel, it absolutely does. Do you see where I'm going with this? The problem with general YouTube advice is how much of it is consolidated in very specific niches of YouTube and is coming from absolute outliers versus what would be true in the case of the median or the mid-tier content creators where success is achievable 
and where those people have to be replaced at some point among the 15 different category verticals of YouTube. And I've studied the 15 different category verticals of YouTube and I've coached a creator to a silver play button. I've coached a creator at least once to a silver play button in every category vertical of YouTube, which means I've coached a travel person uh, to it. I've coached a vlogging person to it. I've coached uh, beauty to it, DIY, science and tech, um, automotive to that. Flyride being an example of that, Chris from Flyride being an example of the automotive niche and so on and so forth. Gaming, like A Drive uh, helped coach him to a gold play button, actually. So, like, there is fitness. Uh, Dr. Mike Diamonds helped him get a gold play button. So, uh, travel, um, Black Experience Japan. So, like, I, I've helped coach YouTubers in different uh, vertical categories, even anime. Um, yeah, I, I've coached people like Anime Balls Deep and Geekdom 101 and uh, Mr. Senpai. So like I've I've done different verticals, but then I've done sub niches, but the verticals are actually really important because the verticals actually have a determination on the business plan of YouTube, the thumbnail strategy of YouTube, the editing style, the scripting needs, the overall um, technical ability required and so on and so forth, the level of acceptable thresholds of quality, on videos, the upload cadence. So, um, you know, overall structure of the video, pacing of the intro hook, you know, that sort of thing shifts with intent based on the category vertical. And there are 15 of them. That's what the YouTube categories are. They're 15. And the reason they're 15 is because they're also the advertising verticals. They're the advertising verticals that um, the brands use on the other, the business side. So th this is why it has this determination. This is the kind of thing I talk about with the Awesome Creator Academy members. And this thing I do in my coaching is um, we, we analyze these things and then we also look at um, data points. And I try to um, use my knowledge from having coached personally, literally hundreds of creators at this point to then say, okay, from the data that I've seen across these things and the data I still have access to, what's publicly available, what I privately have access to, what do the numbers say? What do the numbers dictate? Have the numbers shifted in this quarter? Have they shifted in this year? What is going on? What is consistent? Okay, now let me reduce everything to what's consistent because I can't predict month to month, season to season, quarter to quarter. What's true in a more evergreen way? And where's all this leading up to? And what's the, what are the brands doing? Where are they seeing? They have more data than me. What are they doing? So uh, like that's where my head's at with this stuff. That's where my head's up with this stuff. Also, I won't say tags don't matter until YouTube gets rid of them. When YouTube gets rid of them, then they don't matter. When YouTube depreciates and deprecates that feature, then you can say it doesn't matter at all. It must matter to some degree. And what the degree to which it matters could change. YouTube could change its mind and tags could all of a sudden become the most important feature for all we know. Until YouTube gets rid of it, I refuse to believe that it has zero impact. I will not trust that it has zero impact until they get rid of it. Because then I know it can't touch me. It can't help or hurt me in any way once it's gone. So I will assume that everything matters to some degree until YouTube gets rid of it. Because then it can't help me and it can't hurt me. Mostly my TV says that's what happened to us in 2020. We were at 2,000 subs and we were some of the first to talk to about similar checks in one month. 31k subs, then made um, 33,000 that month, made 75,000 that summer. Congratulations. Yeah, that's a really great success story. I love hearing that from the community. So I think uh, what uh, SMA Sky is referring to is hashtags. They're saying those three hashtags that YouTube puts at the top can directly can direct people away from your content unless you have tags that only you use. That's true if you use the hashtagging strategy aside from YouTube Shorts uh, hashtag, yes. But even the existence of the Shorts tag being a best practice for YouTube Shorts suggests that to some degree, tags and hashtags would matter in YouTube if there's a reason that the best practice according to youtube.com and YouTube HQ and the help documents that hashtag shorts if hashtag shorts matters then you can't say that tags don't matter to some degree in YouTube because then why is hashtag shorts a best practice that comes from YouTube corporate 
Why is hashtag shorts come from YouTube corporate if tags don't matter? Think about that for a second. Yeah, the more accurate thing would be people shouldn't stress out over tags. Yeah, titles, topics, thumbnail, timing, transcript, all matter more. Um, Mentor Mentoroso says, will you create more content for YouTubers based on gaming? I will, but I think they'll respect it more if to some degree there's at least a cameo of a collab with gamers with 100K or a million that I've worked with in the videos because gamers are very particular and they want to hear it from gamers because I may be a gamer but not a YouTube gamer. They would think my information is sus, but it's actually really good. So they need to hear gamers co-sign what I say. So until I can get some of my friends in gaming on a video and take time out of their schedule and out of their day to do me a solid, it's almost frivolous for me to do it unless I just mention people and shout them out that, I, you know, in which case I, I kind of want to be respectful of that, which I could tell a little bit of their story, but I want to brag on them more than anything. So I have to be careful about how to do that in videos. Because one, I don't like taking credit for anybody's success because they had to do the work. I can only provide the information resources that I have, but I can't take credit for their success. That wouldn't be right. That wouldn't be fair. Um, I can admit that we work together and I can tell them uh, what I think this person does very well, why they're successful, why their community loves them. And I think that's respectful to do. But to some degree, they need to see it from some to some degree from someone they relate to and they care about because just hearing it from me even if I have the data, even if I have the numbers, even if I have the case studies, I just don't think that a lot of gamers respect someone who didn't do YouTube gaming. But if I just have the cosign of people who are in it and said, yes, everything you said is what I did and it's correct and blah, 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 then that goes a long way with them. So if I did make gaming specific content, it would be using those framing devices because it'll be better received by the community. If people can say, yeah, that makes sense. I did that. Or, oh, yeah, here's someone that I've, res I've watched, I've heard of. Yep, they're crushing it. That's why. Okay, that makes sense. So, yeah. Oh, and yes, I, I, Doug, Doug's right. I, I'm not saying that hashtags and tags are the same. But, again, similar enough to where you get the point. Dan says, hey, Roberto, I'm not sure what I should focus my channel on. I'm searching for my first um, software engineering job, and I want to talk about my journey, but also I want to talk about things related to coding. So if you had a background, I assume, in computer science, maybe what you could talk about is to some degree being out into the job market for the first time with this degree and do degrees matter? And should you get a degree in computer science? So maybe to some degree, you mirror a little bit of Ali Abdal. Maybe look at early content from Ali Abdal when he was studying uh, to be a doctor and did study content at Cambridge. Maybe not everything you do has to be about coding, but maybe it could be, and that could be dope. So maybe you become the computer science version of Ali Abdal and see where that takes you could be interesting, could make you a millionaire for all I know. Um, I think that if you're going to tell your journey and your story, I think it should at least be interesting in concept, but also in relatability of the title, but also interesting in the videos. When I tried to tell my story sometimes and do vlogging, it didn't work because it wasn't interesting enough to watch. Or sometimes at first, at first, it wasn't interesting enough to listen to. I had to learn to become a storyteller in my own way and in my own fashion. And it's not the same as the great storytellers of YouTube by any stretch of the imagination. Now, with faceless channels, I could do that. I could do that around subject matter that I find interesting. I might experiment with that on this channel to make a point with you guys and make a completely faceless video that is a documentary style video that is a love letter to some of my favorite YouTubers. Like I might do a video that's a documentary that I might do on Casey Neistat one day, right? And that'd be a faceless video where you don't even see me in the video. And it's really just all about Casey. Um, that being said, um, I think that there's something to being 
and refining your abilities as a presenter, I think you can tell your journey. You can be authentic. It doesn't have to be too polished, but I think there's something to just learning to tell a good story. I think I've become a good enough um, communicator and storyteller to where I can keep y'all's attention for four hours straight with no editing. So I think there's some, some value to that. How important is using the community tab feature versus just posting video content? I actually, if I was doing what I'm supposed to, I'd be using the community tab every single day. One of the best things I've told people, especially the, my gamers that I work with with Supercell, use the community tab every day. Uh, Game Changer, also great for not only, too many of you are focused just on the video content, for making money, for making my use your YouTube community tab. Maybe I'll do a workshop Wednesday on some point about using the YouTube community tab effectively. Um, that might only have to be a two hour workshop Wednesday but it's incredibly powerful. Is it better to let YouTube create chapters or create on your own? Create them on your own. Create them on their own. Should I put hashtags on my shorts for gaming? Uh, I would use the shorts hashtag if you're doing shorts. If you're doing YouTube shorts, I'd at least use the shorts hashtag. Um, Prince Shakura says, what are good ways to improve growth once you start to find traction in your niche or passion? Go back to your analytics. Use the 80-20 rule. I talked about this in our content strategy videos. Go to my uh, live tab in YouTube and then look at the live streams on content strategy. Other than that, use the video that is in my homepage that, is about, that has the thumbnail that says 0 to 50K. Use the strategy outlined in there. That will help you with your growth if that's what you're concerned about. But the 80-20 rule of using your analytics to find what gave you the most overall subscribers if you're looking for growth and then revisiting those topics and either making a trilogy or, or a series around the things that grew you the most would help you if growth is your goal. But also remember what I said about the data um, and the numbers surrounding a three-video-a-week upload cadence and then optimizing those around videos that can get subscribers. So a three video a week cadence of what can get subscribers is the best overall approach to growth. Yeah. But anyway, we're about to hit the four hour mark. It's 11 o'clock. I need to go to bed. I've got to wake up in the morning. So we're going to close out the stream with a couple of things. We're going to start with a thank you to our sponsors, StreamYard, simplest uh, live streaming in the world. Linked in the description, let me multi-stream on six different platforms at once right now, soon to be eight different platforms at once. Thank you to our friends at Opus Clip for letting me upload to about six different platforms, soon to be more, I think, um, and repurpose my content. Uh, stay tuned for replays of these cut down into smaller bites on the Roberto Blake Highlights channel, aka also called uh, Roberto Blake Speaks. So. Um, definitely going to be doing highlights. I'm going to probably cut up this stream. Uh, that's why I got to cut it soon. So thank you to our friends over at Opus Clip. And shout out to our friends at Kajabi for helping me with building my $5,000 a month income stream on memberships and doing over $100,000 a year in my coaching business. Kajabi is the best platform for courses, community, coaching, and cohorts. And it's not even close. Used by people like myself. Sean Cannell and Ali Abdal. So you definitely want to make sure if you're in the education side, you're in the coaching business, you want to use Kajabi. Free trials to all of these linked in the description down below. Thank you everybody for joining the live stream. We're going to close out as usual with the trailer for my book, Create Something Awesome, How Creators Are Profiting from Their Passion in the Creator Economy. Thank you everybody for tuning in and we will see you for Wednesday. We'll do a workshop Wednesday and of course, Friday for another FAQ Friday where we answer all your questions and dive into analytics. Stay awesome. Bye. I finally did it. I finished my book, Create Something Awesome, How Content Creators Are Profiting From Their Passion in the Creator Economy. The book is available now in paperback and in Kindle where you can read it on any e-reader or device. And I'm really excited about this. The audiobook is coming soon, probably October 2022. Oh my God, it's so great to be able to have this book done, put it up on the bookshelf, and to know that all of you who appreciate it, you want to hear what I have to say about the creator economy, becoming a full-time content creator, and what the experience and lifestyle of being a content creator actually is like, 
Uh, this is the book. I, I put 20 chapters in here of the most important things I think that content creators could be focusing on today. I talk about the mental health aspect of being a content creator, uh, getting discouraged, imposter syndrome, not charging what you're worth, and mostly actionable advice around monetizing your content properly, but also how to build an audience on your authenticity and what it's really like to start from zero, even today. So if you're interested, make sure you're checking out the book. You can order it on Amazon. You also probably order it in a lot of other places like Barnes and Noble, and it will be coming to other bookstores soon. Really excited about it. Thank you for all the support and love around the book and the positive reviews. Now go ahead and pick it up and make sure you go out there and create something awesome today.